I want to express my gratitude first, Tom, for you doing this. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for doing it, for God's sake. So that's yeah, much more difficult than what I have to do. That's true. <laughs> and hopefully this will be fun. Good. Let's make it fun. Okay. Um, and I know that you got uh, the topics that we were going to discuss today from Lisa last night. But we thought we'd start kind of slowly. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions okay. about your childhood. Go ahead. So um, what was your childhood like? And I wanted to know if you um, had a call to theology when you were a kid. Yes, I did. But you should understand that um, I grew up in a broken home with a deeply uh, alcoholic and pathological father with whom I had many intense conflicts. But at the same time, I loved him very deeply. It was a very kind of complex relationship. But I grew up in a family that, in a sense, was a pathological family. So that I grew up with conflict and with tensions and with terror. So I was sort of conditioned by this in my childhood. And you say you had a, a theological call when you were a kid? Well, I had a deeply religious sense that was independent of my family because uh, my family, at least at that point in their lives, they didn't go to church or anything. And so I didn't have any religious life through my family, you know. And whatever I found, I largely did by myself. But I did have this strong religious sense and sensibility. And I tried to read various things and explore various things. Hmm. Yeah. I remember you saying that you built a little chapel out of yes. chairs and a sheet. Um, right. That I had of... a little chapel that I made. I used to pray there regularly. Yes. <laughs> Childish. Okay. <laughs> so, were there any theologians or artists or thinkers in your in your family history? Not really. I, I had um, actually my father whom, you know, despite the fact that I had such profound conflicts with, I also deeply admired. But he was a very brilliant man, even though he was pathological. But he, for example, would explore all kinds of things, and I would often participate with him in this. I mean, he developed, for example, a deep interest in literature and a deep interest in philosophy and theology, and I shared this with him. Mm. Mm. Yeah. He was an attorney. Yes. He was in many ways a successful, he's a very brilliant man, a truly brilliant man. And um, when he became deeply alcoholic, he couldn't really practice law on his own. But there were a couple of big attorneys who uh, sort of employed him to get some of their own work done. And they were Jewish, so he established a real uh, Communion with the Jewish community where I grew up in Charleston, West Virginia. And that was very unusual. For example, he gave two birthday parties for, he would give two birthday parties for himself, one for Gentile friends and one for Jewish hmm. friends. Because those two worlds didn't mix in those days. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I became uh, very interested in Judaism. I would regularly see uh, the local rabbi. And this, this was an important part of my life, yes. Hmm. And then later on I had very special relationships with Jewish theologians. Hmm. Yeah. So I was rereading parts of your memoir the past couple of days. Oh, really? And, and I found myself, I mean, I think it's a wonderful book. Do you really? I, I, I love it. And I was very um, curious and very interested in what you talk about at the beginning, and specifically around preparing for the Episcopal ministry and ah. you failing a psychiatric exam. Right. And I was curious if you could say a little bit about what that was. Well, at that time, no, I shouldn't say at that time. The Episcopal Church, to which I belong, had only recently instituted a rule to the effect that every candidate for their clergy, what they called their priesthood, had to pass a psychiatric exam. And this had to be a full genuine psychiatric exam conducted by a professional authorized psychiatrist. So in the face of that rule, I had to undergo a, a psychiatric exam. And I thought I did fine on it, you know, I didn't see anything wrong with it. 
And then I heard from uh, the diocesan officer, but we need you to go again. That wasn't enough. So I had to have uh, an even deeper exam, and this time they sent me to a professor of uh, psychiatry at Northwestern who was a specialist in psychological testing. He'd even written an immense tome on psychological test, published an immense tome. At any rate, I underwent a three-hour examination with him and he had his associates. He had a, some assistants. He had a big office at Northwestern. He was, it, that was in the Northwestern Medical School, one of the major medical schools. And this was one of the major psychiatry departments. And so they did this thorough examination of me. And then I was uh, informed by the Dean of the Theological Seminary that I was in fact a deeply sick person and could expect to be institutionalized within a year. That I was so deeply damaged they couldn't quite imagine how I was making it on my own, which I was of course. At any rate, uh, well, that deeply shook me. And I received very deep support from a marvelous human being, one of the best human beings in my life. His name was Wilbur Kotz. And he had been dean of the University of Chicago Law School. And he was a deeply committed Episcopalian and very theological one. And he sort of took me under his wing because he had been attending this little Episcopal mission where I was in charge of it. And we became quite close. And then he really sustained me in this critical period by his own counsel, even offered to pay for psychoanalysis, and I refused that. But he himself counseled me and was with me quite a bit, and he's the one who really pulled me through it. So I was very fortunate to have him at my side. Mm. And so I came through it. Say something about what you were doing at St. Mark's Mission in Chicago. What's that? Say something about what you were doing at St. Mark's Mission in Chicago. Oh. Well, I was assigned this. I was then uh, a candidate for the, what they call the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. And I had to have uh, some kind of church work or whatever. And I was assigned actually to be in charge of this small interracial Episcopal mission on the south side of Chicago. And it was then the only interracial church in the whole Diocese of Chicago. But at that time, there was little interest in such things, and nobody ever came to visit the church, which amazes me now. Here it was the only interracial Episcopal church in the Diocese of Chicago, one of the very few in the world, and never once did anybody from the Episcopal church even visit it or take any interest in it whatsoever. So I, I later learned what bullshit all this interracial talk was anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, uh, I then was assigned to that, and of course, I couldn't celebrate sacraments because I wasn't a priest. But I preached there every Sunday, and I exercised a pastoral role. I counseled uh, members of that little church. It was a small church. So I was there for, what, about a year and a half, something like that? And it, <laughs> so, later, uh, when I was being rejected for the priesthood of the Episcopal Church because of the psychiatric exam, and they told me that they couldn't imagine how I could possibly be a pastor. I said, look, I was a pastor for a year and a half in one of your churches. Why don't you investigate that? Oh, that's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody even bothered to investigate. But I, I think I was... I wasn't a good, I mean, hell, I don't claim to be a good pastor, but I had a good relationship with many people in that church. Mm. And it was a genuinely interracial church. It got split almost evenly between blacks and whites, which made it an almost unique church in those days. How do you remember your years at Chicago? What? what? Graduate school. Well, I have all kinds of memories of it. You don't want me to talk about that. Uh, maybe just the, uh, at your advisor, whose name escapes me at the moment, who was German. Joachim Bach. Bach, yeah. W A C H. Bach. Uh, he was uh, he was more than an advisor. He was a dear friend. Uh, he was a very distinguished scholar. In fact, he, he most famous as a sociologist of religion. But um, he was a German scholar. And he was partially Jewish. He was a Christian, but he was partially Jewish. 
and his family had been persecuted in Germany. And he ended up, I think he first went to Brown and then he came to the University of Chicago. But he was chair of the History of Religions Department at the University of Chicago. And I became sort of his protege or whatever, a kind of assistant. And I spent a good deal of time with him. And we had a community there, the students of, history religions is what used to be called comparative religion, you compare different religions. And we had a genuine community, which we called the Sangha, that's a Buddhist term. And, uh, and that was a rich part of my life because there were some fine, interesting people in that history of religions program. And of course that in itself distinguished us because we weren't focused on Christianity, you know, and so therefore we were sort of out of step with the main body of students in the Divinity School. Wasn't Charles Long one of those people in the Stangha? Yes. And he, he was in he did his degree in the history. He was a little bit behind me. I mean just you know chronologically. And I think who he else came in, in a couple of years after I did. Who else do you remember? Oh, I've forgotten their names now, but oh. uh but, oh I just can't remember. But I was, one of them, for example, became a distinguished Lutheran theologian. Uh, there was a very mixed bag, very mixed bag. But I thought we had the most, well, of course I was biased, I guess, but I thought we had the most interesting group in the Divinity School. And the one thing that did set us apart very much was that our focus was not upon Christianity, but upon non-Christian traditions, yeah. Mm. On the other hand, Richard McKeon was an important influence on you, wasn't Very he? Very important. I didn't come close to him, but he was the god. When I was at the University of Chicago, the god was Richard McKeon. And I did study with him. Just like everybody else, I was absolutely intimidated by him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was a kind of god. And uh, he was the dominant figure at the University of Chicago, at least outside of the sciences. Of course, the Chicago was very strong in the sciences. But in the humanities, it was Richard McKeon, yeah. And then another Chicago person was Caldwell, important to you. Oh, yes. Well, of course, he was president of the University of Chicago. He'd been dean of the Divinity School. And well, later, uh, he, see, he would have been president of Emory, except that when the time came to appoint him president of Emory, this racial crisis broke forth. And that's, that's just the time when they had that big crisis about the public school thing. And it just became impossible uh, at Emory uh, to appoint someone who wasn't fully active as a anti, you know, integration. It was a terrible time anyway. Mm. So at any rate, he, w he really came from, he, see, he'd been president of the University of Chicago. And, and before that, the dean of the Venice School at the University of Chicago. And he was himself a distinguished New Testament scholar. But he was supposed to go to Emory as its president. And that broke down. And so he did come there as director in the Institute of Liberal Arts. Isn't he the one who had wonderful parties that graduate students were invited to, you were talking about? No? No. Oh, no, sorry. No. I didn't know uh, anyone in Emory like that. No, not at Emory, at uh, Chicago. Oh, Chicago, yeah. But, okay, I thought we were talking about Emory just then. So I also found uh, something very interesting in your memoir at the beginning. We were talking about a, um, a seminal experience that you had that seems to have determined your vocation, which was an experience that you had around Satan. Could you say a few words about that? <laughs> well, yes, I can say a few words. Uh, this is somewhat painful to recall, but one evening, while I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago and living alone, in the middle of the night, a strange epiphany occurred, and I had this experience of the body of Satan enclosing me within its grasp and initiating me into its body. And this was very real, 
very real indeed. And uh, I just had the, the, the sensation of being drawn into the very body of Satan. And then I awoke. And, well, it took me a long time to get over this, but finally I did. Hmm. But no, that was a very real experience. And you don't know this, I'll tell you this dogmatically. I'm the only theologian of Satan. That is to say, uh, I'm the only theologian. Now I'm talking about, uh, I'm not talking about fundamentalists, you know, I'm talking about real theologians. I'm the only real theologian, as far as I know at least, who even writes about Satan. So that's sort of unique to my vocation as a theologian, but it's inescapable that this deep experience of Satan lies behind there. Mm, yeah. And it's inescapable in terms of what became the death of God theology. In many right. Ways. And this is something that was almost impossible to communicate when the death of God theology was so popular. It was the role of Satan in all of this. And it, it's just so difficult to make this Blakean Satan, you know, real to an audience today. I mean, it's, it's really very difficult stuff. Mm. And I, I never quite learned how to do that. Mm. Can you talk about what's real about the Blakean Satan? Well, I don't, what do you mean what's real about it? You just said that you didn't know how to make this Satan oh, real. Oh, I didn't. To... What I meant was I didn't know how to make this vision of Satan real to an audience today. Right. So if you like, I didn't properly know how to speak of Satan, how to evoke Satan in a language that is actual and real. So say something about the Blakean Satan. <laughs> well, that's a tough subject. You know, we could spend hours on this, but uh, first of all, just objectively speaking, I think you could say that there's, there's no figure other than Milton who even rivals Blake in terms of the vision given us of Satan. I mean, Blake has this incredibly comprehensive vision of Satan and enacts Satan throughout all the poles, points of our lives, and enacts Satan in such a way as to, uh, I don't want to say tame Satan, but to give us an actual vision of Satan. But this is extraordinarily important, and every Blake scholar has to wrestle with this, because Satan is so important in Blake's works, it's so absolutely important. And the most revealing thing of all, which I like to center upon, is, is in, Blake wrote these great uh, illustrations of the book of Job, one of his most famous works. And on the 11th plate, which I centered upon, uh, we get this enactment of the Lord's, the Lord God, the Lord God's final epiphany to Job. And you look, and on his left foot, we have this uh, <laughs> figure of Satan, so that uh, Blake is obviously enacting the Lord God whom we know, the absolute creator whom we know, the absolutely sovereign God. That's actually Satan. This is very, very radical stuff. The, the image of God has a cloven foot. Yes. 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 Cloven foot, right. But at any rate, this is very radical stuff, of course, and most people are close to it. But uh, I, I guess I'm, is that right, Lisa? I think I'm the only theologian who's really make Blake central. I'm the only Blakean theologian. Which, you know, I just, I just can't understand that to me. Blake is just so important. But it, Blake is also very, very difficult. It, it takes a hell of a lot of work to master Blake. That's true. And it's Job who has that on his left foot, you say, in yeah, that well, illustration. Yeah, this is Blake's image of Job. Of Job, yeah. yes. Yeah. And can, but, you, can you say... Uh, uh, no, excuse me. No, no, no. It was the Lord God. It's in the book of Job. It's in the book. There is this epiphany or manifestation of the Lord God. And it's in that epiphany that the God of that epiphany has the cloven foot. Got it. It's, it's okay. God. Okay. God is Satan. Right. right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is deeply fundamental in Blake. 
And there are other expressions of this is just the most dramatic expression of it. That's mm -hmm. the, the easiest to recognize. But uh, at any rate, I did a book on Blake, and Blake's been very influential throughout my theology. Mm -hmm. You published that book in 1967, and then in 1985 you did your uh, study of Christian epic. I think the Blake led you into the study of the Christian epic literature. I think that Blake initiated me. And you traced that from Dante through Milton through Blake through Joyce. Right, right. And uh, can you say something about that, uh, how you came to this um, kind of architectonic vision of the Christian epic through time? that's in the uh, history as apocalypse? <clears throat> well, let, let me, yeah, that, that, let me speak about that, that book, which is so important in my work. Now, one thing that's unique about this book, so far as I know, and even about my theology as a whole, I'm the only theologian that I know of, at least, who actually employs great and fundamental historical events, such as, say, the French Revolution or the English Revolution, as a vehicle for actual theological inquiry. So um, I, I attempt to employ great primal historical events as theological events, as ultimately religious events. And I'm the only theologian who does that, as far as I know. So that's sort of distinctive to my work, but fundamental to it, really fundamental to it. Is that Hegel's influence? Well, not only. Um, well, when, as a graduate, no, throughout my education, I was deeply exposed to historical thinking, not only in Hegel, but in many other arenas as well. But, but Hegel... it's in part Hegel's influence, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I am an Hegelian theologian. Blakey and Anagir, and yeah. And Nietzschean, I would say. And what? Nietzschean. No, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. But you see, um, you you have uh, you propose in the history as as apocalypse book that um, there's a kind of revelation history through these great epic poets, right, and right. Uh, and that you take that seriously as a kind of continuation of. Uh, the biblical revelation. Right. So but there's the biblical... a continuity between the Bible and this history. Right, right. And then so many of these visions are responses to the historic moment in which the epic poet was writing. Right. right. You know, right. Um, right. Dante and the uh, monarchism, uh, yeah. uh, Milton and the uh, English Revolution, right. um, Blake and the French Revolution, right. and Joyce, I don't know, the kind of um, universality of the 20th right. century. All the all of these as kind of revolutionary moments in history that are that are reflected artistically in these poets, right? Yes. yes. And um, and you trace that as a biblical revelation history. Right. 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 So you know, as I was preparing, I was also looking at this video that I mentioned that I found yeah. on YouTube of you in the 1960s, where you're talking about the death of God theology. Yeah. And I wanted to read to you something that you said into the camera, and I want you to respond to it. Okay. Death of God theology witnesses to a newer form of Christ, a fuller, more total, more universal manifestation of Christ. What this kind of theology makes possible is a Christian living in the world, fully in the world, totally in the world. And we don't have to be bound up in a nostalgic memory of the past and live in fear of some kind of distant, invisible, and oppressive God. Good. I like that. You said I said that. You said that. <laughs> Good. I second it then. <laughs> you, you second that. <laughs> well, there's another quote that you say is central to the death of God theology that okay. brings up uh, this word that's been so important, kenosis. Right. The emptying out of right. God. Right, right, right. And I want to read this to you. It's from the book of Philippians. Yeah. And you read this one as well. It's from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Right. In your relationship with one another... Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
Rather, he made himself nothing, or he emptied himself out. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Yeah, that's, that's probably the most fundamental of all biblical texts. I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's solid gold as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, can you say a little bit about how important that particular word kenosis is and how, how, how it is central to your thinking as a death of God theologian? Because uh, this is a death of God theology that understands the death of God as the canonic or self-emptying embodiment of God. That God has ultimately given himself or itself to us, to the world, so that he has emptied himself of his own glory, his own transcendence, his own power, and become empty for us given himself totally to us. And that's what the death of God means. So that's very fundamental. Yeah, very fundamental. So the death of God is truly religious. Oh, yes, of course. It's the self-sacrifice of God. Yes. But many people hear the death of God phrase and they think it means that uh, we've, uh, the secularization idea, we've, we've just put right. God behind us. Right. Um, your theology affirms the death of God as a religious idea, as a religious, oh, yeah. uh, symbolic transformation of the divine. It doesn't mean the end of it, right? It no, means no. a new form of it. Yes. Well, if you like, it goes hand in hand with resurrection. And the resurrection can't be real apart from the crucifixion. So uh, the total uh, enactment of God is inseparable from the death of God. Yeah. And so the... The, the emptying out of God into creation is, is, is part of this, uh, right. the death of God. So then you, you right. mentioned the resurrection. So where is the, the resurrection in that? Well, the resurrection is the final, if you like, uh, realization, the final enactment of this initial death, this initial self-emptying. So resurrection, from my point of view, fundamentally means the opposite of its common meaning. Uh, the resurrection is the absolute finality of the emptying of God. And has it already happened? Is yes. it happening well, now? It's, it's happening right now. It's, it's, it's happening it's now. Still happening, yeah. So is it a continual death and resurrection? Yes, I, th I think that, you know, we can't understand when it would literally come to an end. That's beyond us. But nevertheless, yeah, it is a fundamental sense that, yes. Death and resurrection are correlative. Right, you can't have one without the other, really. Uh -huh. So it, even they're directly correlated. So the more the death, the more the resurrection, right, right, actually. Right. Because the emptying, the fullness of the emptying is the right. realization. Right, yeah. right. How does that differ from resurrection as traditionally conceived? Well, it's hard to know what you mean by traditional. Oh, like in the Catholic Church, uh, in, in the early Christian tradition... The early Christian church right. tradition. We can't know fully what exactly they meant, of course, but uh, let's put it this way, in popular Christianity or in common Christianity, resurrection is just glory. It's just totally positive. Whereas it seems to me critically, resurrection is inseparable from crucifixion. So therefore, it's inseparable from an absolute chaos and death. And that's what popular Christianity ignores. It wants only the glory of the resurrection. But. And what's the problem with that? Well, that it just loses what the real meaning of resurrection is. You know, there are, there are you know, movements like, say, Lutheranism, which so deeply emphasize the cross and the passion of God, you know, and... Uh, want to solve any understanding of resurrection that's independent of crucifixion, which is so very important. But, you know, there are Christian movements like Lutheranism, which really center upon this. So the popular version wants to excise the, the yeah. chaotic element in right, particular. Right, right, right. And, and the death. And the death. Right, they don't, they, they don't accept the death, yeah. Yeah. And the darkness. Right, right. You know, I would often say, if you don't accept the death of God, then you can't possibly be a Christian. Hmm. I mm. used to say that out loud. Yeah. 
and incur a great deal of wrath. Mm. Can you say more about what that means and how it's fundamental to Well, I, I could go on about that forever, but you remind me of debates which I used to have with the fundamentalists and, you know, whatever, Protestant conservatives or whatever. But I used to accuse them of being non-Christian, and they would just get furious. And I said, let me help you convert to Christ. You know, these are very strong evangelical leaders, you know, have this, you know, this big authority and all this shit. And I would say, is there any way to convert you to Christ? Is there any way that I can lead you to Christ? Can, can we give some witness to you that would open you to the reality of Christ? Oh, they would get so mad. They would become just absolutely furious. I'd love them goad them in this way. But <laughs> Like Montgomery. Like what? Like Montgomery. Oh, uh, oh well, no, I actually had a better relation with him. I'm thinking more popular. He, he actually was a responsible theologian. Most of these fundamentalists that I would debate with, you know, were ignorant people and... Uh, no, Montgomery's a serious person. What do you remember of the debate with John Montgomery in the University of Chicago's Re Rockefeller Chapel that night that right. um, it was filled to exploding onto the lawn outside? Right. Uh, this was one of the high points in my life in many ways. See, I, I spent many years at the University of Chicago, and this was a great big thing that occurred at the University of Chicago Chapel, Rock, Rockefeller Chapel, which is a giant Gothic chapel. It's a great big giant Gothic chapel. And on this occasion, it was absolutely full. I had a debate with John Warwick Montgomery, who's probably the leading evangelical theologian in the country. And it's a big debate, and it's a big advertisement for it. And they, I didn't know this, they bust in apparently thousands of people from churches and various places to witness this big debate. And so, Rockefeller, I mean, the, the, the chapel, which is an enormous chapel, it was jammed. And not only was it jammed, but the territory all around it was full of people, and they had, mic, you know, what loudspeakers out there to try to convey this to them. At any rate, and I was there uh, with, with, with uh, Wilbur Cotts and his wife, uh, and at any rate, it was quite an occasion. And I for, they did record it, didn't they? Mm -hmm. they, they it's been, yeah, the debate has been published. It's been published. And recorded, yes. But. And recorded, yeah. yeah. So that, that's sort of a big thing. And I, I had fun at it, yeah. I had fun. Did you win? I, I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> he, look, Montgomery's a good man. And he, he did, he's, he's, he's got some power. So I wasn't just debating a nobody. I was debating a strong one. Was there a particular way in which you, which he was coming at you? Was there? I don't, a, I don't remember no. that. Uh, you know, uh, he gave a straightforward uh, defense of a uh, classical Christian position, and would doubt what you know. He would doubt things that I would say as being hollow. You know, he he, had, he was responsible. Yeah, yeah. But I was surprised. I had no expectation that there would be so many people there. That that came as a big surprise to me. Well, it was the height of the death of God debate era, yeah, right? right? right. Uh, when it was a media sensation. And somebody did do a somebody, for example, organized buses to bring people. You have to organize that. Yeah. I think it was in the winter of uh, 1967, and the death of God craze had been already going on for a year or two. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, yeah it was. Uh, and the death of God thing was quite that. That was quite intense, and it lasted a longer period than one would expect it to. Sort of like early 70s, it started tapering down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. And then you turned to Buddhism through the 1970s. How do you see this transition? What what brought you th this transition from sort of Blakean, Hegelian? Uh, well, don't forget, don't forget that as a graduate student, uh, a primal area of my study was Mahayana Buddhist philosophy. So that even as a graduate student, I was already working on Buddhism. And my interest in Buddhism was wholly theological. I meant it to say, I, I wasn't doing it historically or linguistically or anything. I was doing it theologically. And I was really doing it as a way to recover a deeper Christian theology. That was my motive. But at any rate, I, I had been immersing myself in Buddhism for some time. 
and meeting with Buddhist scholars and thinkers and having conversations with them and that sort of thing. So this went on for many years, actually, many years. So when the people involved in Buddhist Christian dialogue, like John Cobb, right. Robert Thurman, yes. but also um, from the East, uh, Abe, Abe, Nishitani. Nishitani. I was close to Nishitani, very close to Abe. And you were invited to Japan, you were invited to yes. Korea. Yes. Uh, in Japan, in Kyoto, uh, I, I met with some distinguished Japanese philosophers and had conversations and dialogues with them. And uh, I discovered that in Korea, one of the problems with Korea then was that there was so much political oppression that they allowed very few events. And I, I later learned that, that I was quite popular, but a major reason for that was the Korean government was so repressive that they would scarcely allow anything to occur, you know. And I later learned that my lectures in Korea were just untouched by this political censorship and people could go to something came to them. So they ran had a larger audience than I certainly would have ordinarily had in Korea. And so I was sort of a significant figure in Korea that almost the only one who could speak out forcefully and say anything, and which I did. Did you ever make it to China? No, no. India? No, no. No, the, the, it was only Korea and Japan that I really encountered, and most of Korea, and to, to a significant extent, Japan. But so I had many Japanese and Korean friends. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of your study of Buddhism, and particularly your study of, of nothingness yes. and the nothing. Yes. I'm really curious to hear what you see as being the major difference between the Christian nothing and the nothingness that you studied that's a, that's in, a profound problem. in the Buddhist tradition. That's a profound problem. And there certainly is a difference. Uh, most simply stated, I think, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now speak from a Christian perspective, that uh, sunyata or nothingness or emptiness in Buddhism is in a sense an absolute voidness, whereas the Christian or Western nothing has an actuality that's sort of Western in a way. In other words, uh, put it this way, the Christian nothing can appear as Satan say, which would be impossible for the Buddhist nothing. That uh, sunyata can have no truly negative epiphany as the Christian nothing does. That's one way of citing a difference, I think, that's significant. Uh, but of course, another big difference is that uh, sunyata is so much more central in Buddhism than the nothing is in Christianity. That, that's probably the deep difference. That the Buddhists can hardly say nothing from our Western point of view. Let's just say sunyata. The, the Buddhist sunyata is primal and central in Buddhism in the way that the nothing could never be in Christianity. Except, and he was influenced by Buddhism, and some of these uh, evangelicals will point this out, you're, in, you're influenced by this negative, alien, atheistic Buddhism. Uh, yeah, but I would actually get that criticism mm -hmm. publicly, that I have been influenced by an atheistic Buddhism, a demonic Buddhism. I mean, you know, some of these uh, Christian fundamentalists know non-Christian religions as religions of Satan. Mm -hmm. So the Buddhists are really Satanists. And so naturally, they know the Buddha, Buddha is the nothing who's really Satan mm -hmm. because they're enslaved to Satan. See, I would encounter that too. Yeah, I You'd imagine. be surprised. No, I, 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 there are people who really believe that. If you're, you're a Buddhist, you're some kind of Satanist. And at, this, at, the, at the same time, this nothing that you are writing about and have been for you know, decades, yes. it's something that emerges historically. Yes. It has a real historical dimension, oh, yeah. and it wasn't possible in terms of the, the primal roots of Christianity. It's something that comes much later. Yes. What, what is that? Can you say a little bit about how it develops historically, how it comes to us? Well, most well, it depends. I mean, you, you know, we got a radical process of secularization occurring here. we got all kinds of forces playing into this, but uh, it's not a simple process. But let's see how to get hold of that question. Augustine. 
Huh? Augustine. Augustine. <laughs> Because I'm also an Augustinian, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of many things. <laughs> because of his view of um, God as the um, oh, yeah. oh. as a, as the plenitude of being. Oh no, um, no, no, that that that's that that's a Thomistic element of, of Augustinianism, which is alien to me. No, no, no. Uh, what, what's really central to me in Augustine is the understanding of uh, sin, death, hell, Satan. Uh, but uh, sin and grace, yeah. I don't know. Well, Emily Zumbrun writes about Augustine as uh, God is uh, sort of everythingness. And uh, we creatures are, are in between the everythingness of God and the nothingness um, uh, that we are created out of. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're between, the, we, between zero and one in a sense. And uh, so when we turn to God and um, rely on God, we're, we're, we're becoming everything with God, face to face with God maybe. Um, but the more we turn to our own creatureliness and do our own will, the more we're heading toward the nothing. Yeah. And that's where the nothingness has vitality and it, it's an actually annihilating power. It's, yes. a, it's an annihilation of creation. Yes. Um, and so I think that's where the, the, that sort of um, consuming underbelly of an active voluntarist nothing, a, a nothingness that's full of a will, a right. negative will, um, is born. In, and then it, it keeps re-emerging in the history of Christian thought. Yes. So you didn't say very much about this um, notion of the nothing as different from Buddhism, but it seems to me um, when you say of it, it's an it's an active nothing. Um, it's it's because um, all of existence in the Christian tradition is that God creates the world, and everything comes out of a decision of it's God's will. It's the divine will that sustains all things, and um, and insofar as the human will turns against God's will, it goes toward the nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how does the death of God connect with that? The creatureliness as a nothingness, um, always threatened by return to the nothing, and uh, and uh, the death of God being a kind of willful um, connection to God as creator. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> oh well, you can elaborate a little. How how? What's your take on it? Well, this language, you know, is not integral to me, but uh, well, one problem here is the question of being and being and nothingness. And uh, Augustine's very difficult. I, I don't want you don't want me to speak on that, silly. I can't anyway. It's alien to me, but. Uh, my Augustinianism really revolved more about uh, the Augustine of the Pelagian controversy and the, the Augustine of uh, the controversy about sin and grace and damnation, etc. That, that sort of thing. But uh, Augustine was nevertheless an extraordinarily powerful influence upon me. I did my master's thesis on Augustine. Can you explain what that is, the Pelagian controversy, and, and how that, uh, that particular um, piece fits into your thinking? Well, that's a little, the second part of that is difficult to, to respond to. But uh, in the Pelagian controversy, it's really a profound controversy about grace and the uh, role of grace in redemption and uh, damnation, for that matter. But it has to do with, um, in a fundamental sense, uh, this is where I think the deepest theological foundations of Western Christianity were created. And it had to do with understanding the um, absolute primacy of grace. And that it's our resistance to grace, which is the source of the fall, etc. But uh, this became extraordinarily powerful. I think you could say that Augustine is the most influential theologian in the West. And the, the Pelagians were condemned as heretics. Yes. And what was the heresy? 
The heresy was that uh, the human will plays a role in redemption or salvation. That, that the Pelagians, the Pelagians in some ways, I think of them as being common sense Christians. And they thought, for example, as they are attacked by Augustine, they thought, for example, that uh, we, we play a role in redemption, that, that we have to freely respond to redemption and freely choose it and play a role in enacting it. And this Augustine assaulted as an absolute refusal of grace. So the Pelagians became condemned and uh, slaughtered, of course. Uh, and Augustine was the primary enactor of that condemnation. But this was a great, big, enormous controversy, and it deeply influenced Christian history. Right. And in your thinking, grace and will, how do we locate your thinking in terms of those two concepts? I haven't been able to use will very much. Or I've tried to use it, and I haven't done very well. Grace is very important for me, but because I am an Augustinian. And uh, I, I, I do think that uh, nothing's possible apart from grace, etc. Hmm. Seems to me you talk a great deal about will and uh, the, the trajectory of the will from Augustine to uh, Nietzsche. And you talk about um, will in both Augustine and Nietzsche being essential. Well, certainly it's essential to Nietzsche, no question about that, yeah. yeah. You don't remember ta writing about the will all, in uh, Genesis and Apocalypse? It seems to me it's absolutely central, this notion of how the will is transformed um, from Augustine to Nietzsche. Well, that's interesting that you would say that. I, I... Yeah, will is... Uh, Repeated again and again on every page. Yeah, <laughs> maybe need to reread re that. Yeah, book. I have to reread that. Yeah. <laughs> so, from where you're sitting now, yeah, in terms of responding spontaneously to the question of will, yeah, do we have any will in terms of our relationship to salvation, redemption? Well, this is an extraordinarily important question. I, I don't doubt that, and it's a very important question to me. I just find it increasingly difficult to speak about the will. I, I don't doubt its ultimate importance, and certainly its importance for Nietzsche. There's certainly no question about that. But um, it's become a difficult for question for me. I can't respond to that very well. Hmm. Is there any connection between a Nietzschean will to power and the death of God? What do you see there? Oh, yes, of course. That, uh, in a fundamental sense, the death of God is the consequence of an absolute will. That in a very deep sense, uh, Nietzsche's will to power realizes the death of God. And the death of God is impossible apart from the will to power. And is itself uh, an enactment of the will to power. So now these, are, these really go together. I think there's no question about that. And in that case, the, the will to power is extra human? In oh yeah, th th we're talking about something that's universal here. It's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's far beyond the, what we know as the human. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a voluntarist notion of will. Uh, it's not like in Spinoza where the will is um, um, kind of underived or self-derived. Right. Yeah, uh, this it, is a this is a, a a decision to will. Yeah, well, this is a very active will. Yes, yes, uh, it, it's, it's the will to power. I mean, it's just absolute power itself, yeah. You know, I, I have some more questions about Leahy's work and his okay, influence. Let's in talk your, about Leahy. And, but, the, you know, the question of will is very interesting because in one of his later books, he speaks of will essentially as being um, sin itself in some way. He pins will to intentionality and dis differentiates intentionality from what he calls attentionality in some way. Or um, um, anyway, I think the, the question is, is that, I mean, do you, do you see yourself uh, agreeing with that particular oh, discrimination? No. I, I'm very dif distant here from Leahy, uh, particularly at this point. Yeah, in which way? 
Well, uh, the, the will uh, is primal for me in a way that it's alien to Leahy, I think. Uh, yeah. Well, here's to put it simply, I'm a Nietzschean as he is not. And uh, Nietzsche's will to power. I have a very positive relationship to it. He has a very negative relationship to it. That's one of the points at which there's a real chasm between us. And uh, that's also related, of course, to the Catholic-Protestant uh, difference between us. He's so deeply Catholic. And I guess, yeah, particularly in his perspective, I am deeply Protestant, which is alien to him. Can you say more about that? The, the difference specifically between the, the Catholic and the Protestant that you're bringing up here? Well, of course, this is a deep and profound difference. And we'll, let's go back to the question of grace. For the Catholic, including Leahy, there's a sense in which grace is integrally a part of nature itself or of reality itself. That reality itself or the world itself or nature itself embodies grace activates grace. So in a fundamental sense, the more there is of nature, or the more there is of actuality, or the more there is of life, the more there is of grace, to put it simply. Whereas for the Protestant or the classical Protestant, of course, you know, Protestant's difficult because there's so many kinds of Protestantism, but for the classical Protestant say, uh, there is an antithesis between nature and grace, and uh, an opposition between uh, that which is given as the world, or as our body, or as nature, and a redemptive grace, or a saving grace. There's a kind of dichotomy there, or opposition, or difference, which is annulled in Catholicism. This is one of the deep conflicts between Protestantism and Catholicism. And where does the will fit into that? Well, I, from my point of view, and David probably wouldn't agree with this, that, but from my point of view, uh, the will is much more active in Protestantism. That uh, the, 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 pro, pro, the Protestant begins in a totally sinful condition. And he has to be awakened from that condition. Whereas the Catholic think there's a continuity between a, a natural condition and a saved, a redeemed condition. There's a continuity there. Whereas for, in the, for the Protestant, there's a dichotomy, there's an opposition between the two. So for the Protestant, in a fundamental sense, you have to conquer your will or negate your will or, you know, say no to your will to refuse, in a sense, what you are to be open to grace. Whereas for the Catholic, I think there's a continuity here that, that grace evolves out of or is realized in our natural condition. Not that you don't need the grace of God, of course you need the grace of God. But nevertheless, there's a continuity between the grace that is given in uh, redemption and the grace that is given in creation. So there's a continuity between creation and redemption in Catholicism, which is alien to Protestantism. So it's the Protestant who has this overwhelming sense of original sin, say, and of original darkness, etc. Whereas for the Catholic, there's a real grace in nature, in the world, in the creation, that's in full continuity with the grace of redemption. So, to me, that's the ultimate difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, mm. which, in a sense, the other things revolve about. You sent me a couple of papers recently, um, one I believe called uh, Catholicism and Freedom. Oh, yeah. And uh, you mentioned several times in your corpus, you know, how important Catholicism has been to your own thought. And in this particular paper, there's a quote that I wanted to read to you, yes. something you sent me recently. Perhaps never before has the modern world most needed the Catholic Church and above all so in the arena of freedom itself, a freedom that modernity imagines that it is realized. But this may be well, sorry, 
Uh, but this may well be the deepest illusion of modernity and one that, that Catholicism can most expose. So in what sense is Catholicism in a position to expose the illusion of modernity? Well, I think at this point, the deep and fundamental difference between Protestantism and Catholicism is very important. That um, the Catholic has an openness to that which is truly nature or truly creation or truly the world, which the Protestant does not. Now, the question of freedom here is very difficult, of course. And one of the big questions here is, what is the relation of freedom, say, to the creation, or freedom to nature? It's a very difficult question. But beginning from my point of view with what I think is the collapse of freedom that is unrecognized in our world, and one way of, uh, I don't think the Catholicism can resolve the question, but I think the Catholicism has a great deal to give to this question. Uh, well, here, here I'll express some of my hostility towards Catholicism. I think one of the problems with Catholicism, just humanly speaking, uh, their theologians and the clergy, etc., and the hierarchy, they're, they're, they're so obsessed with, they're so wrapped in the ecclesiastical questions that they're closed to one of the, almost all the fundamental theological questions. So that we're not getting much Catholic leadership here in terms of thinking about the ultimate category. I think that they seem to be much more obsessed with it or concerned with it or whatever, practical church problems. Catholic theology is almost totally a church theology. I mean, in our world, which to me is a decline of Catholicism. But at any rate, uh, I, I'm probably going to give up on this See, I was writing a book on radical Catholicism, and maybe I'll finish it, uh, we'll see. But at any rate, uh, I do think it's very important to awaken people to, to radical Catholicism. And by the way, I have a simple response here, which, which won't make sense to most people, but that's, that's okay. Uh, one of pe people keep asking me, well, give us an example of radical Catholicism, and I have it. The Catholic epic, and two primal names here. Dante and Joyce. Now, they're both profoundly Catholic. Of course, now here you have to, this is something I've done some work on, namely on Joyce. Uh, you have to have a theological understanding of Joyce, which is very rare. But at any rate, if you have a theological understanding of Joyce, then you can see, I think, the deep relevance of Catholicism to some of our questions. But, but you have to have a theological understanding of Joyce, and that's very rare. I'm not making much sense, I really Can you just say a little bit about what that theological understanding is? Just a paragraph or so? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, let's put Joyce and Dante together. See, to me, Joyce and Dante are both primal, primal figures. And one of the things which they share is this universal vision which I think is deeply Catholic. And they have an openness to all dimensions of the world or of life or of humanity. And one of the great geniuses of both Dante and Joyce is the way in which their visions integrate everything that give you a genuine wholeness, a genuine fullness of the totality of life and the world, which is so important. To me, this is very deeply Catholic, very deeply Catholic, even though few Catholic theologians can do anything with it. But anyway, to me, that's deeply Catholic, and the great embodiments of it are Dante and Joyce. And one of the deepest problems and questions is, how do you relate Dante and Joyce? And that's one of the things I've recently been trying to do. It was just a damn tough problem. Damn tough problem. But that's a way to thinking about some of these fundamental questions that we've been discussing. And, uh, you know, if I... Uh, I've never been asked to do this, but I'd like to be asked to speak about radical Catholicism at a Catholic institution. 
I'm a, I'm a, I consult somebody if that could be possible. But, uh, you know, one of the things that baffles me about contemporary Catholicism, there's all this interest in radical politics or whatever, but no interest in radical Catholicism. And I don't know why. But do you see Leahy as a radical Catholic thinker? Oh, from my point of view, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And now, he's also, and this is one of the paradoxes about Leahy, he's more orthodox than the popes are, you know. Yeah. I mean, he's absolutely orthodox in the way that no pope has been. I mean, there's a pure orthodoxy in Leahy that's uniquely his own. And so it's hard, odd to think of orthodoxy in this way. But simultaneously, he's our most radical Catholic thinker. So he's simultaneously deeply and purely orthodox and deeply and purely radical. And, you know, to me that's, well, that's, that's even though it's so difficult to understand Lee, nevertheless, I think that's something that will really attract people once it becomes known or established. Because, uh, you know, here he is, he's a more orthodox Catholic than probably any Catholic is alive, including the Pope's. Certainly, he's more Catholic than the present Pope, that I question. Uh, but at the same time, he's an ultimately radical and original thing, or deeply original, and he has to be radical to be original. When I was first reading Leahy, um, I was trying to grasp the relationship between Leahy and the death of God. So I asked him in conversation, um, is God dead? And he said, oh, I hope so. <laughs> so one of the really radical things about David Leahy as a Catholic is that he's a death of God Catholic. Oh, yeah. And yeah. in fact, there couldn't be this new thinking now occurring without the death of God. Absolutely. It's absolutely essential. No, he's one of uh, the primal thinkers of the death of God. You might say it's the doorway to the new thinking yeah. on this death of God. So do you want to talk about the difference in, of the death of God in Altizer versus Leahy? How to think about that? Or is there a continuity between the two? Or are they different? Well, that, that's, that's again a very, very difficult question. Uh, we want it. We, we want it. Let me, let me you remark can handle about it. something that I don't think I've even mentioned to Lisa. Uh, David uh, once uh, questioned me or uh, challenged me about uh, my characterization of my being initially drawn to his work. When I was speaking about my sort of conversion to Leahy's work or whatever, when I was speaking about that, you know, I've written about that. And Leahy was responding to that. And he wanted to correct me. He said, what you've missed is how deeply I shared some of your thinking about the death of God. And that was uh, very much a part of that which drew us together, that both of us were deeply thinking about the death of God. And it was true, of course. And I don't mention that when I mention my attraction to Lee, but at any rate. Well, in a way, I'm sort of glad because uh, I, that would hurt Leahy, perhaps. And I don't want to hurt him, of course. But I am shocked. Of course, this is one point at which I'm anti-Catholic. You know, we think the, of, of Catholics as being uh, positive about the mind and all that sort of thing, and about philosophy. But there's, there's something deeply anti-intellectual about contemporary Catholicism. Deeply anti-intellectual. And uh, maybe that's a part of their fight with mo the modern world. You know, they've been engaged in this enormous conflict with modernity. Even David's in conflict with modernity. But the Catholic Church as a whole has just been so caught up in this absolutely war with modernity. And that, in many ways, isolates them from radical thinking because they're so hostile towards modernity. Well, they've suffered so much from modernity. I mean, you know, the Catholic Church has been uh, violently assaulted by modernity. And they really lost. But at any rate, that was one of the things that David challenged me on. He said, you didn't realize that one of the things that drew me to you was your own thinking, your own understanding of the death of God, you know, that that drew him to me, as it were. And I don't mention that when I talk about this, and maybe I should. 
Well, this, I think, is a great moment to uh, talk about apocalypse, the notion of apocalypse, because it's important in both of oh, your that's right. bodies that's of right. thought in a very similar way, because really what you're both thinking is the apocalypse of God, that what formerly was understood to be God has to come to an end, right. that this new thinking be born, that this new reality be born that's kind of done with that. Yes. And uh, even Leahy has the concept of the, um, the um, uh, tr transcendental dichotomy, which is to say that everything that came before is now over. It's gone. It's gone yeah. Everything that was God, everything that was the church, everything that was politics, everything that was art, it's all over. It's gone. And the dichotomy is between that past and the new now, which is an absolute actuality um, that now we know we are in a completely new reality, new time, new actuality. Um, and that's an absolute apocalypse right there. Yes. Uh, that now goes on. There's nothing but apocalypse from now on in Leahy's thinking, in, yes. is, is a, I read him. And I think the same can be said of you. How do you understand the difference between apocalypse in Altizer versus apocalypse in Leahy? Or is it the same apocalypse? Well, I don't want to say it's the same, of course. He certainly has a much purer understanding of apocalypse than I do, but uh, well, and I got problems here. For example, what what does apocalypse mean for David in relation to the church? He's very conservative about the church in many ways, and that's something that baffles me. You know. I, it, it, it would seem to me that uh, in many ways he's deeply an anti-church thinker. But he would never accept that, of course. Never. I mean, that's a part of his lo being a loyal Catholic, which is alien to me, that I just don't understand. And so how can he be a loyal Catholic and apocalyptic Catholic at once? Uh, to me... Apocalypse is a profound heresy in Catholicism. That in a fundamental sense, Catholicism arises or originates with a reversal of an original apocalypse. And that's deeply present, deeply the center of Catholicism. You know, it's anti-apocalypse. Uh, it's negation of the original apocalypse. You know, now David won't accept that, of course. But then uh, we were never able to talk very much about the church. You know, he, he's sort of strange in many ways. Well, we're all strange in many ways. But one of the things that, that I criticized him for, and I openly criticized him for this, he mentioned, for example, that there was a young priest. You know, he belongs to this church right down the road here. He regularly worshiped there. At any rate, they had a new priest who just graduated from seminary. And apparently, uh, this young priest uh, had made it clear to David that he had a genuine theological intellectual interest. And I said, David, for heaven's sakes, why don't you pursue this? Why don't you take him out to dinner or something? And, you know, he's just a young, naive priest, but I'm sure he would really be enlightened by you. And I said, well, you know, why don't you want to talk to him? And he said, no, I, I really don't want to talk to him. And he didn't want to talk to him. I mean, that, 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 I mean there's this, you know, it's just a little thing, a local priest. But still, that's a way of affecting the church. I mean, I, I don't think David really wanted anything to do with the church concretely, although he worshipped there regularly. I mean, he's very good, you know, a tender of church. But I, I was just surprised that, and, and so far as I know, I'm trying to think, did he have any relationship with any Catholic theologians? I wasn't aware of it, at least. I can't think of any. Uh, he did read Rahner, but he preferred Bart by far. Yeah. He was more excited. He was a, tremendously excited by Bart as a theological yeah. thinker. He, yeah. he um, very much appreciated your theology. Yeah. Um, of the moderns, uh, I don't think that he had a very strong relationship with um, the 19th century Catholic, uh, his name is escaping me, who wrote about the, uh, the evolution of, Catholic, of um, Christianity. He wrote, um, the name is escaping me. Um, he wrote uh, Apologia, 
<laughs> you don't mean the Lubach? No, no. He's the one who wrote about the evolution of Christianity. He's known for that. Um, who's the Catholic thinker? 19th century. Newman. Sorry. Oh, Newman, <laughs> for God's sake. Yeah, his name was escaping. <laughs> Newman, um, and actually, just for historic reasons, let us mention that when, when uh, Leahy was first uh, pulling together his theological thinking for presentation to the public, it was at the Newman Center at New York University in the yeah. 1980s that he was first formulated, he was invited to do a series of lectures right, right. at the Newman Center that later became uh, Novitas Mundi. Yeah, and right, so, right. Um, you know, Newman was one of those radical modern Catholics, and I think David Leahy uh, appreciated him without being deeply provoked by him. Uh, yeah, I don't, well, I don't think, I can't remember having a conversation with him about Newman, because I'm a kind of Newmanite myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember ever talking about Newman with David. I don't think that we well, did. Well, he he read all his books. I saw them. Right. No, he didn't yeah. read all of them. First of all, Newman was one of those pe these people who wrote an enormous number okay. of books. Okay, he read the major <laughs> works of Newman. Yes, he definitely <laughs> was fluent in Newman. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, to me, uh, it's actually the, the last theological pope, I've forgotten what his name was, at any rate, he identified Newman as the greatest modern Catholic theologian, as the greatest Catholic theologian since Thomas Aquinas. Do you mean Ratzinger cum Benedict? Ratzinger? No, no, no. this was a pope earlier than Ratzinger. At oh. any rate, whatever, that, that's not really important. But at any rate, there was a pope who publicly said that Newman is the most important Catholic theologian since Aquinas. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Tom. Um, you previously mentioned uh, the original apocalypse in Christianity um, as contrasted with uh, the modern notion of apocalypse, mm -hmm. which uh, you see being manifested in much of modern history um, and uh, maybe particularly focused in the French Revolution or the, the modern revolutions are mm -hmm. apocalyptic revolutions in history. but. You view the uh, Western tradition as inherently, at bottom, um, apocalyptic because it's founded in and grounded in an original apocalypse of Christianity, which is the apocalypse that uh, Jesus was uh, foreseeing and uh, enacting. enacting. So can you talk a little bit about how ancient and modern apocalypse, um, the continuity there, or how that continuity is actually disrupted by the anti-apocalyptic um, forces at work in Western history? Well, see, that's, it's very important to mention that, because it seems to me that apocalypse itself has been profoundly disenacted, disembodied, uh, throughout our history. That, that, that's been one of our primary problems, that this original gift, this original glory, has been so transformed. Now, in a sense, that transformation was absolutely necessary to actuality itself. But in another sense, it's a great betrayal of what we were given. And one of our ultimate challenges is to recover apocalypse. And, of course, I'm an apocalyptic theologian who's been trying to do that. But it's to me, strange and interesting that there are so few apocalyptic theologians. Yeah. See, I can't understand why this is so unpopular in theology or, you know, so neglected or ignored or whatever, my God. Well, wasn't your thinking fed by the work of Rudolf Bultmann and others uh, who uncovered, and, and uh, also um, um, the German um, scholar, I'm sorry, Otto. I'm really poor on names these days. Who? Otto? Rudolf Otto? No, I was not thinking Otto, because he's more theological and, oh. and really like a comparative religion. But uh, no, I was thinking of uh, the Schweitzer. Okay, Schweitzer. And um, actually, before Schweitzer, the um, friend, friend of Nietzsche, Weiss, right? And the friend of Nietzsche, right. um, uh, um, o Overbeck. Franz Overbeck. Overbeck was absolutely discovering the apocalyptic right, Jesus, right. and Schweitzer, and and uh, he's covering yeah. both Overbeck and Weiss, 
And then um, Boltmann inherits that history and is also um, affirming the apocalyptic yes. uh, aspect of Jesus. And so all of that influenced you to connect, right, the, the biblical apocalyptic right. texts with modern apocalypse. Like, can that, you say more about it? Yeah. Well, first of all, it seems to me just obvious in a fundamental sense that New Testament scholarship as a whole, on the whole, has demonstrated the absolute centrality of apocalypse in the New Testament itself. Even though that's an apocalypse that has been radically transformed the course of Christian history and in the church. But nevertheless, it's absolutely primal in the New Testament itself. It's not just Boltmann. It's even the great majority of New Testament scholars enact that. Now, I did inherit that. I mean, that, I have been much influenced by New Testament theology. That's quite true. And I was deeply concerned to try to recover that original apocalyptic ground in contemporary theological thinking. Yes, that's an absolutely primal in my work. Can you say more about the, the meaning, what it means now, apocalypse, yeah. today? Okay, that, that's amazing. When you say today, <laughs> what does it mean to the average Christian? I don't know. But Well, I mean today in your th in, in, as you are uh, thinking about it inside of your... Well, for example, what, what I've tried to do is to find a contemporary or modern language and symbolism through which to express uh, that which is the deep ground of Christianity, Apocalypse itself. So that, uh, for example, I've been very much concerned, let's take Blake. Now Blake is profoundly apocalyptic, deeply, deeply apocalyptic. And even though he didn't know much about New Testament scholarship, nevertheless he was deeply immersed in the New Testament and uh, the apocalypse of the New Testament is absolutely fundamental in Blake's work and Blake's vision. So, of course, that's been a deep ground for me because I've been immersed in Blake for a long, long time and uh, have been a Blakeian for a long time. But at any rate, to me, Blake is a glorious, or Blake's work, is a glorious expression of a core or center of the New Testament, which has been lost theologically and in the church. But Blake recovered it profoundly. And in recovering it, established one of the ultimately revolutionary grounds of life and world itself. And that's one of the things I think we can see through a blank that the, a genuine apocalypse is truly revolutionary. It truly turns everything upside down. As, as Blake enacted it. So that, uh, you know, here we have a recovery of the original uh, Christian ground in a profoundly revolutionary way, which in many ways makes that original way absolutely real today. And say more about the original way. Well, let's just take Apocalypse itself. Now, Jesus' uh, primary language about apocalypse is kingdom of God. And even though everyone who even reads the Gospels knows how primal kingdom of God is in the language of Jesus, uh, nevertheless, there's been uh, almost no understanding of the kingdom of God in our Christian tradition. I mean, for example, it's understood literally as the reign of God. Well, th this is not an apocalypse. I mean, we've understood kingdom of God in a literal sense as the reign of God. The kingdom in that sense. And myth, its original apocalyptic significance. And thus a fundamentally uh, misconstrued and turned away from the primal ground of Christianity itself. So that's been very fundamental in my thinking. Very deeply fundamental. So, so it's in that sense, I'm a biblical theologian. People think that's very strange. You know, when I debate fundamentalists, I commonly say, I just wish I could lead you to the Bible. I wish I could open you to the Bible. And they get so mad. They just, you know, I, I, that just drives them to fury. You know? I say, Can I initiate you into the Bible? Is it possible that you could become open to the gospel? 
See, they're deep fundamentals, and they're just so absolutely outraged by that. And they're Bible thumpers. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say more about this difference between the reign, of, theologically, like what kind of God are we talking about if you have a reign of God versus the kingdom of God? How is it, it seems to me you understand kingdom of God is actually a dissolution of the whole notion of a transcendent God in place of, in, in favor of a God who's here and now, right. transformative. Right. Well, that, 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 that's the, you've got the whole point right there. That as opposed to a reign, which is a kind of eternal reign, or a, and a kind of kingdom in a literal sense, kingdom of God in its original sense is an apocalyptic, absolute transfiguration. It's the breaking or dawning of the kingdom of God is the absolute transformation of the world. Whereas to understand the, reign, the kingdom of God as the reign of God is to understand that in a world that continues and preserves. A status quo. Right. Things right. as they have right. been and right. things as the church may want them to be right. too. Right. right. So you said that the original apocalypticism of Jesus and the early Jesus movement was lost don't you mean something a little stronger, like repressed or well, denied reversed, or reversed? Yeah, yes. it's a stronger, it's actually actively crushed out right, by right. later doctrine. Right, right. Can you say something about orthodoxy and how it crushes out the apocalyptic, why so, and, and uh, why you as a thinker want to reverse the reversal right. affected by orthodoxy? Yeah. Well, you said it. What, if, what can I say? <laughs> we want to hear you say it. What? We Expand. want to hear you say it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Having difficulty. Uh, how can you be? Are you listening? Let's put it this way. I am baffled and troubled at the reign, the dominance of a kind of simple conservatism in our religious and Christian worlds. That uh, there's a kind of very simple conservatism here that it seems to me is an absolute violation of the Bible at all. But there seems to be little recognition of that. Why is there little recognition of that? Why is there so little recognition of how profoundly Christianity has betrayed Christianity? About how profoundly the Christian tradition and the church have negated the gospel. Why well, is there so little concern with that? That, that? that really troubles me. That really baffles me. Why is that? Why are there so few radical Christians? Why? Have you figured out why? No. <laughs> How about Soren Kierkegaard? How about what? Soren Kierkegaard. Oh, well, that, well, there we have a great one. Well, you know, it's interesting. In many ways, Soren Kierkegaard has been the most radical of all Christians, and in many ways, the most anti-Christian of all Christian thinkers. And actually, the, most Kierkegaardians understand that very well, I think, very well. And I think it's interesting that conservative Christians who have any sense are anti-Kierkegaardian, and they should be. Incidentally, and that's another thing that many people don't know about David, was how profoundly he was into Kierkegaard. And you know, he, he, he bought every single volume of Kierkegaard, even the, and read them, even though, my God, again, you know, what are there, about 100 volumes of Kierkegaard, something like that. And David was mastering all of them. It was, I think Kierkegaard was the deepest influence. Little, little I asked influence. David, I asked David what thinker in modernity is most important to yeah. him. And he answered Kierkegaard. Yeah. 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 And of course, he took Hegel with absolute seriousness, but Hegel's an ultimate enemy. Whereas he could be, you know, whereas Kierkegaard is the opposite. The reason being that in Kierkegaard, the, um, the actually existing individual is the knot that, t that fastens the thread. So it, that, that absolute insistence on the particularity of the individual. Yes. Um, and that, you know, because Leahy's a thinker of particularity, um, and he thinks that all of modernity, in, in a sense, is a <clears throat> misplaced um, 
concreteness. Uh, what is it? Whitehead's phrase about the the um, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Mm -hmm. Um, that in a sense all of modern thinking is a fallacy of misplaced concreteness and he wants to um, uncover in his apocalyptic thinking the, the absolute concreteness of the world, the absolute particularity. Um, and Kierkegaard was that thinker who, who, who had that, it's, uh, not in the thread. So you don't keep on just spinning modern thought uh, freely, but you have this uh, commitment to the particular um, that that could become the tie, you know, the 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 place you uh, get real. Um, so I would like to ask you um, about this um, trajectory uh, from early apocalypticism in the Jesus movement and um, how that gets repressed in the history in connection with the notion of God, because. Um, in the it, one of the things that your thinking wants to uh, completely uh, abolish is this transcendent God, the God reigning over history, mm -hmm. and um, and wh what is the connection between that um, uh, challenge to the transcendent God and um, modern death of God thinking? And what, where does it take us? Where is it going? What's, what's the, um, the core idea there for you? Well, I think it's very important here that to recognize that from my perspective and others' perspective, this dominant image of God, this dominant idea of God, the absolute transcendence of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is very important to understand that as an ultimate pathology, as an ultimate sickness, as an ultimate uh, blackness. And uh, here's, here's where Blake is, is perhaps most uh, relevant. Uh, because uh, for Blake, you name that absolutely transcendent God, Satan. And that itself is liberating as you come to recognize that this absolutely transcendent power is an ultimately satanic, self-negating, self-emptying, alien power. Now that's, that, that's really very, very important here. And we were talking uh, earlier, which one, we were talking about Bergman? Uh, Ingmar Bergman, the films Bergman, of Bergman. Yeah. I mean, okay. one, one of the things that, of course, in some of Bergman's films is so powerful is, is to show this, this, this ultimate transcendent uh, power mm -hmm. It's an absolutely uh, negating, uh, you know, alienating. But I mean, Bergman does that so marvelously in film, and and to me that's just so theologically important, so theologically important. I don't know whether we ever told you this, Lisa, but when uh, Ray and I were, you know, we had this, these ambitious plans for this big religious study center at Stony Brook, and we we're raising money. Well, Ray was trying to raise money to. Uh, Establish some major professorships there. And for example, one of the people that both of Ray and I wanted to try to get was Bergman. Did you know that? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had this dream, this vision. And among other things, to symbolize what we were doing. That, you know, that, that, this is a religious studies program that say it's taking someone like Bergman with ultimate seriousness. So. Yeah, his films realize the, the hatred of God, the, the um, the sense of um, judging the judge, you know, like um, being under this, um, you know, this dictatorship almost, mm -hmm. of, you oh, know, yeah. this hatred of the, of, of God. Um, but it's also kind of like a hatred of the father, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. the loved father has to be hated in order to uh, proceed with life, yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, moving to modernity, um, modernity is in um, in attacking the church and in um, abolishing um, high Catholicism um, and sort of releasing the world to live um, on its own lights, in its own stance. Um, God is more and more realizing an incarnation in the world by emptying out, realizing an incarnation. I'd like you to connect uh, this whole trajectory we've been talking about of rediscovering the apocalyptic in its connection with incarnation 
and with the uh, disappearance of transcendence, the, ab the abolition of transcendence in favor of an incarnational theology. Well, see, to me, in a fundamental sense, this is the essence of the original apocalypse. That the apocalypse is the actual, the actualization of the depth, the deepest depths of God. That uh, in apocalypse, the depths of God are released into the world, are actualized, are embodied, are made absolutely real here and now, right now, right here, you know. And Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding up the self-embodiment of God, which you call your first real book. Do you yeah. want to talk about how in writing this book, which was published in 1977, um, how is it that you came to this first real book that you wrote about the actualization of God as both the death of God, through the death of God, the incarnation of God, or the full realization of God? Yes, yes. Well... This, in a sense, is a novel kind of theological writing. I, to me, this is pure theological writing in the self-embodiment of God. Certainly my purest theological writing. And one, one of the things it's trying to do is recover or realize a language that, in a fundamental sense, witnesses to a total presence of God or a total presence of Godhead itself that insofar as we look up or look away, we're in fact turning away from God. That, that, that's a way of refusing God. Because to refuse the incarnation or the total presence of God or the total actuality of the Godhead is in fact to say no to God. So I want to try to say that the, the deepest no-sayers to God are the orthodox of them. And the people with this purely orthodox, you know, purely transcendent understanding of God, they're the ones who are the deepest no-sayers to God in our midst. They're the ones who are turning us totally away from God. They're the atheists. Right. The real atheists are the orthodox. I kept trying to say that. In a literal sense, you know, literal atheists. The literal real atheists are the orthodox. I remember... Jacob Neusner, the Jewish studies scholar, recognized the self-embodiment of God as within the inner circles of Torah. Uh, I didn't hear the last The one. inner circles of Torah. Oh. So if, Jacob Neusner recognized the self-embodiment of God as a book um, that belongs in the inner circles of, of the Torah. Torah. Yeah. Of the Torah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you want to say what you, you remember, Jacob? Oh, I was so grateful for that, so profoundly grateful for that. Uh, you may not realize this, a Neusner is probably the most important Judaic scholar, maybe in the world. But at any rate, he's got a tremendous authority. And he's done a tremendous amount of work. He's written far more than I. He's probably written 500 books. But at any rate, uh, he is sort of the most famous... Jewish scholar in our midst. He's deeply Jewish. And uh, he's deeply theological too, which is unusual for a Jewish scholar. But at any rate, for some reason, I've never quite understood this, he came up, it's on the blurb, isn't it, on that book? See what, later, ver, later, later editions. Read it, you've got it right in your hands. No, what, the what later is, editions, yes, but not this one. Oh, not that This one. is the original. Yeah, later editions had it as a blurb. Yeah. Oh, this one doesn't, I didn't realize. No, this is the first edition, he hadn't read it yet, probably. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> at any rate, he's a big Jewish scholar, great big. And he really endorsed this, and... Really, this is saying something very fundamental, as they seldom do. This book is within the circle of Torah, of Jewish law. It's within the circle of Torah. That was really something. See, he, in other words, he was blessing or sanctioning a very radical Christian book. So that, that was very important, very important. Can you say what exactly he meant by that? No, no that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> Did, do you see how you understood how he meant that? Well, I, I didn't understand it that critically or that subtly or that deeply, but I, I, I was profoundly grateful for it, profoundly grateful for it. Now, Neusner has many problems. One of them is an ego. 
he has as giant an ego as any academic that I've ever met. I mean, he, he reverse, reverse, rever, reveres his own work in a fundamental sense, which is alien to me. But and he's made many enemies in the world of Judaism. So in some ways, it hurt me to have Neusner embrace me. Yeah. But he's the most famous of all Jewish scholars. I think you could say that. Yeah. Let me ask you uh, how uh, you're also very much a Nietzschean theologian, oh, yes, right? Of and so you take Nietzsche's notion of the death of God and make it into a, a theological uh, proposition. And um, so, um, h how is it that you're you were reading Nietzsche and Hegel both from graduate school? Yes. Um, how is it that Nietzsche transforms Hegel for you? Because you do put them together. You create a kind of synergy between Nietzschean thinking. How does your Nietzscheanism transform your Hegelianism? Well, first of all, I was first deeply into Nietzsche. Only after that, deeply into Hegel. So in a fundamental sense, my voyage into Hegel was through Nietzsche. So from the very beginning, I was doing a kind of Nietzschean understanding of Hegel, which actually wasn't all that unusual at that time. I, I think Derrida does something like this, for example. I mean, this is not uncommon. And I was a part of that movement, if you like, of bringing Hegel and Nietzsche together. So how does he uh, Nietzsche transform Hegel? Well, he radically transformed in, 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 in several ways. First of all, if you bring them together, <clears throat> That makes Hegel radical, and other, and, and other, as, as he is not otherwise. Which in many ways is recovering the real Hegel, because of course Hegel was domesticated by the academic world, profoundly domesticated, and through Nietzsche you can return to the original radical Hegel. Now of course, Hegel himself, as he became older, became ever more progressive. That, that's one of the problems. That, that Hegel himself, in his own evolution, became progressively conservative. And, you know, that, that's something that embarrasses all of Hegelians, or most all of Hegelians, because some love it, but others hate it. But at any rate, uh, in a sense that Nietzsche takes you back to the real Hegel, or the fundamental Hegel, or the deep Hegels, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, it's, as I say, it's, to bring Hegel and Nietzsche together is relatively common. I mean, in, 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 the, in the modern or whatever philosophical world. And what kind of aid did that bring to the death of God theology? Well, it's, it's to me, it's a way of realizing the death of God theology. If you can bring Hegel and Nietzsche together, then you can get a much fuller death of God theology. Because, you know, Hegel, then you can make it fully and comprehensively philosophical or theoretical or whatever, so that you can uh, take it out of uh, the theological realm or the narrowly religious world into the world at large. That's very important, very, very important. But well, just think of those names, Hegel and Nietzsche. God, they're both so important. Now, I'm trying to think, Lisa, am I the only theologian that really tried to bring Hegel and, and uh, Nietzsche together? Perhaps the only theologian. I mean, uh, theologian, yeah. Oh, many philosophers did it. Bracketing maybe certain people that you have in turn influenced yeah. who are also doing it. But yeah, yeah I would say. But uh, Leahy makes the point, which I think is a very significant one, that Hegel's God cannot die does not die and cannot die. Mm -hmm. Now, he writes about the death of God, but that's a death of God that, you know, um, from one point of view, uh, mm -hmm. but, but uh, God cannot die. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, actually, Hegel's God becomes a zombie God, mm -hmm. a God who cannot die, sort of like a, a Dracula cannot die. <laughs> And, um, and, and that's actually part of the, the, the oppressive nature yes. of God, that God cannot die. Nietzsche, because uh, Nietzsche is really talking about the death of God, the end of that right. transcendence, it, you know, no bones about it, right. uh, then you bring that real death of God to Hegel, then you can read Hegel a, a, in a new way 
Um, you're not maybe well, sticking with... Well, I think that was done. That, that, that in, in a great many ways, the, the contemporary or modern interpretation of Hegel is through Nietzsche. Is that is what you're just suggesting. I think that has been occurring. And that's made Hegel real, and, and otherwise he would not be real in that sense. Now, earlier in, our, earlier in our conversation, you were not responding much to this um, notion of the will in Augustine and yes. Nietzsche and how they're connected. But let me read a passage okay. just to jar your memory about okay. this, because um, it, it's, a, it's a whole chapter on this in the Genesis of, and Apocalypse. Um, if Augustine was our first historical thinker, Nietzsche was our last historical thinker the last thinker who could think essentially and historically at once, and thus the last thinker who could understand the will, that very will which was first understood by Augustine, and understood as an empty and fallen will, but nevertheless and even thereby a will that is reversed by the conversion of the will. Augustine finally understands that conversion by understanding the eternal predestination of God, but Nietzsche immediately understood his conversion by envisioning the eternal recurrence of the same, a conversion which enacts itself as an unbounded saying of yes and amen, even as Augustine's conversion enacted itself by a total affirmation of the grace of God. So um, you've got this um, Augustinian will, in a sense, being taken up and converted uh, from a... Um, an absolute yes saying to God, and really, in a sense, a no saying to the world. Because uh, one of the con concepts we have not talked about yet is the idea of the eternal return. Uh, Augustine's idea, we turn back to God. And, we, you know, from our pilgrimage here in this world, we turn back to God and return to God, uh, the transcendent. Um, Nietzsche, his, he picks up on that Augustinian will, but reverses it, and he wills the world as against the transcendent God, and brings the, the will as a willing of eternal recurrence, rather than eternal return. Now, this is an important difference of terminology, like the reign of God versus the kingdom of God, the eternal return to God versus the eternal recurrence, which you understand to be a transformation of that, uh, a turning away from the eternal toward the uh, embodiment, temporality, in, um, incarnation, and so on. Uh, you want to say about how, what is the role of the will in this uh, transformation? Well, you've spoken it very well. What am I going to say? Except, amen. <laughs> well, <laughs> It's connected with this whole creation of the world by God and this divine will that there be a creation, that there be an incarnation. This willing of God is, in a sense, um, repeated in an imitation of God in the, in the, the willing of the individual, wouldn't you say? Uh, the willing to go toward incarnation, to go into the world and to, say, bring God along into the world rather than thinking of God as something that we go back to or return to or that we annul ourselves in order to return to God. Well, I think that you, you realize or you're in the process of actualizing a totality in which all of God is here and now, is absolutely here, not up there. So, you know, that's been important all along. So, in a sense, this uh, will to the willing of the death of God is a willing of the incarnation right, right. and a willing of the life of God. So, right. the key to the living God is the death of God. Right, right, right. The more death of God, the more the life of God. Right. Because God's movement is kenotic and incarnational. Right. Good okay. for you. Very good. Very good. So there's another quote that I want to read from Godhead and the Nothing, yes. which definitely brings up themes that we we're just talking about. Joy is inseparable from absolute judgment, or what Nietzsche could know as an absolute no-saying. A no-saying which he could know as an absolute no-saying. A no-saying which he could know as the Christian God. And if that God is the deification of nothingness, that is a deification absolutely essential for an absolute joy. 
or absolutely essential for an ultimate act of yes-saying. Hence, the genesis of an absolute darkness is absolutely necessary for the genesis of an absolute light, or the genesis of an absolute grace. Here, an ultimate genesis is necessary, necessarily a coincidentia oppositorum. And I know that particular idea is central to your thinking. Right. Can right. you say a little bit about that particular notion? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I rejoice in that, that quotation. I mean, of course, it, so much of that is not my language, but other people's language. But leaving that aside, uh, you, you, you're right at the center of my thinking, or you're right at the center of my theology. No question about that. You certainly are. And I appreciate that very much, very much. Not, not many people can do that. So I rejoice in what, you, what you're saying. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I, I, you know, we, we had this idea of uh, trying to bring the gospel or the good news or joy to the masses, as it were, or through a kind of mass uh, communication or something. And uh, what I refer to as the evangelical circus, uh, which I wanted to be a real circus, but to really uh, make these deep things manifest and actual to everyone. So that, that, that was one of my things I played with in recent years. Not very much came out of it, but uh, I've been rejoice that, that there have been a few people who have respond, responded very positively to this, very positively to it. Norman O'Brown wanted to be part of your evangelical right, right. circus. No, well, of course, that not, this is not obviously. That's right, he's dead now, isn't he? Yes. I hope you know that name, Norman O'Brown, is one of my primal stars or whatever. But, I've uh, seen his name come through. Uh, several of your books. Right, right. He was one of the, one of those radical Freudians who really brought Marx and Freud together, along with Marcuse. It was Marcuse and Brown that had this big influence in the 60s. I think they were our most radical thinkers and uh, awakened us in a fundamental sense to a new radicalism and a total radicalism. And Nor Norman O'Brown, or Nobby as he's known, uh, Nobby embraced uh, apocalypticism too, oh, yes, uh, overtly, and he has a right. book called Apocalypticism. Oh right, yeah, all uh, along and he's been or, an apocalyptic thinker. Oh yeah, yeah, right. and or um, uh, I've forgotten the title, uh, uh, metamorphosis. Yeah. yeah, or metamorphosis and or apocalypticism, something, something like, like that. that. And. He, he, he's doing this more uh, po poetically, right. maybe. Right. Um, and of course, he was a deep Blakeian as oh, well. Yeah. So, you, you know, you've got that Blake, you both as thinkers have that Blakeian apocalyptic oh, yeah. ground we that you share. Yeah, very close, actually, very close. Um, yeah, I, the most exciting response I ever received to a book of mine was Nabi uh, responded to, uh, oh, History's Apocalypse. A chapter on choice. Finally, someone has understood Joyce theologically. That, that to me is the best response to anything that I've written. And Nob Nobby Brown says, Tom, you have finally unveiled him theologically, which hasn't been done before. Well, I, I was really grateful for that. Yeah. You haven't talked about Blake's notion of the self. Um, the self-annihilation of God in Blake. Uh, do you want to say something about... Well, I've just been writing about it. Let's see, trying to think. Uh, now, what have I just been writing? I must be really getting old as I forget things like this. Oh! Remind me of what I'm writing, Lisa. I mentioned it to you earlier. Right now. Oh, um... Um, sorry. Uh, well, at any rate, I'm doing. Oh a, yes, uh, it's a apocalyptic revolutionary apocalypse. Is the title of the piece you just showed me? Oh no, you're. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm, oh, maybe I haven't sent what I'm writing now. I'm, I'm, I'm not, my memory's so bad. I'm not quite sure that. At any rate, I'm doing a little bit of 
revision of my some of my writing now, and it just so happens that I've been writing about the self annihilation of God yesterday and today. Yeah. Now, this is Blakean language, it's very important to Blake, but I think it's also very closely related to Hegel uh, and to Nietzsche, so that it's, it's sort of primal. And uh, that, that phrase or whatever, self annihilation of God, is deeply Blakean, very deeply. But uh, to me, profoundly Christian. Because God annihilates himself to realize his total presence, his total grace. You know. Now, one of the misinterpretations, to my mind, of your thinking is this notion that total presence is a, a plenum, it's like a, it's, it's, it's a kind of total embrace of the notion of presence that uh, is a metaphysical presence, um, a kind of um, total uh, positivity, let's mm -hmm. say. And um, can you talk about how that's not what you mean by total presence? Um, if anything, I would say it's a total presence of negativity, a total, a total actualization of negation yes. um, that is um, fully actual, it creates a totality of the negative rather than the positive. Right, so um, right. that's often misunderstood even by, say, Mark Taylor uh, in his interpretations of you. He, he says that this is a kind of adulation of presence in your thinking. Well, that, that, that's just totally missing what it is. Totally yeah. missing it because, it's, first of all, this is apocalyptic. We're talking about apocalypse. I mean, it's, it's, it's a total presence of absolute annihilation. A total presence of absolute negativity, uh, not a positivity, a negativity. But of course, negativity is a primal Hegelian word. I don't know how Mark got into that. Uh, but, you know, we've been drifting apart very deeply for many years now. You also use the term perishing. Um, uh, with the word a what? Per the word perishing with a capital P in uh, Genesis and Apocalypse and Perry? the Gen... Perishing to oh, perish. Perishing, yeah, perish. So uh, you know, can you, can you talk about how perishing connects with this negativity, and Absolutely. what do you mean by perishing in terms of time and well, history? The, well, the, the given, what Hegel understood, the given, uh, everything that is not transfigured by grace has to perish. There, there has to be an absolute ending. I mean, people understand this with apocalypticism. Apocalypticism is an enactment of a final ending. A final perishing, a final, you know, coming to an end of everything, because only thereby can it be transfigured, can it become new creation, yeah. So yes, perishing is very important. Now, the, the White Hedians also use perishing in a way that's alien to me, so there could be some confusion there. I uh, wrote in my essay on your thinking that this perishing, it's almost like the metabolism of God or the metabolization of God or the divine metabolization because what we know as uh, the, the, um, the temporality, the, the um, finitude of things, mm -hmm. the, the, the perishing that happens in temporality Yes. Um, the trajectory of history in which all things are continually changing, that is the metabolization of God's, um, of God's uh, original form to become, to be in a state of becoming toward um, a, a, a um, ultimate final revelation in history, right? It's, there's God annihilates himself in order to realize himself right. in this metabolization of his being right. into uh, history and time, which empties him out because now he's an absolute negativity as right. opposed to positivity. Very good. Very good. And, um, and this is the apocalypse. Right. This is the apocalyptic history of a realization of God through the metabolization of God's being um, toward the nothing into the nothing, right. em emptying into the out. Nothing. Yeah. Yes. But that nothingness is the embodiment and is the incarnation. Yes. And right. the re it right. leads to the resurrection, yeah. right? So I think this is not well understood in your thinking. Oh, I don't. I'm sure that it isn't. But incidentally, this is another point at which uh, 
I want to be uh, what uh, I want to reflect Buddhism, that, that, that mm -hmm. sunyata or whatever, absolute emptiness. That has to be real. I, I think this is a point at which Christianity and Buddhism come together. Of course, Buddhists understand this as Christians do not. So that's <laughs> not many Christians understand this, but but Buddhists commonly do. I think. Yeah, yeah the, the, specifically around the. The perishing yes. of existence itself, yes. and the con the continual nature of reality being that. Yes, continually emptying itself. Yes. So in in the death of God theology, is there a final moment of that, or is there just a, a continuation there, of it? I think that this this that this is where there may be a deep difference between Buddhism and Christianity. I'm not sure. But in a fundamental sense, uh, the Christian is an, Christianity is grounded in an eschaton or in a finality, in an ending. Yeah, it's here an ending as I don't think there is in Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are so many forms of Buddhism, but uh, I'm sure there are forms of Buddhism that do this. I mean, for example, it's not commonly realized that there are apocalyptic forms of Buddhism, mm -hmm. expressions of Buddhism. Yeah. yeah. How does the ending connect with the new creation? Well, that's just it. You can't have a new creation apart from an ending of the old creation. That there has to be an absolute ending to make possible an absolute beginning. That to have uh, the, the glories of apocalypse or the glories of, uh, well, of apocalyptic glory, you have to have an ending of everything else. So that there has to be an ending of the world. Yeah, ending of the world to make possible a new creation. Yeah. So then you also have the language of alpha and omega. Yes. The alpha is the absolute beginning point and the omega is the absolute end point. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the two faces of God, you might say. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, um, can you describe the primordial God versus the apocalyptic God and how these are correlated with each other? Well, I think that uh, the apocalyptic God is the final actualization of the primordial God. That the original creator, the original Lord undergoes a total metamorphosis or total transfiguration in becoming the end, becoming apocalypse itself, yeah. As creation passes into apocalypse. That's one way of phrasing it. Creation realizes itself as apocalypse. Do you find it? So it, it brings me back to Leahy's thought and what might be the distinction there, the difference between the death of God theology and what he sees as being the, because you're talking about a continual apocalypse yes. uh, and a continual beginning, continual end. And uh, what do you see as the difference in the death of God theology and uh, the thinking now occurring? Well, I think that the thinking now occurring is a profound realization of apocalypse, is a profound realization of a final ending. But that ending is itself absolute beginning. That uh, in, in the thinking now occurring, as I understand it at least, there is indeed an absolute perishing, there is indeed an absolute ending, but that is absolutely inseparable from the glory of an absolutely new beginning or absolutely new creation or new world. But you know, there's, there are parallels between the two here. Mm -hmm. can't be yeah, that, the way you're saying it, it, what is the difference then between what the thinking now occurring is saying and what the death of God theology is saying? It's, it, is it less on the glorification end of things, the, the death of God theology? Yes. I. I, I, I think that's right, that there is, um, in, 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 in atheistic theology, whatever we call it, uh, 
an absolute perishing, an absolute ending that's alien to an absolute beginning. That uh, I think the Leahy, or the thinking now occurring, is close to an absolute perishing. Whereas, the death of God theology is, is grounded in that. There, there, there's here a difference. There's yes. A real difference here. That makes sense. Well, yeah. He, the, the infinite Passover in yes. Leahy's thinking, where the, the, the Misa Jubilea, right, yes. that he talks about at the end of Novitas Mundi. Yes. I have a quote here. I'll just read. It's you writing in Catholicism and Freedom, something you sent me recently. Yes. You're quoting, you're talking about Leahy here. The Misa Jubilea is the infinite Passover of God, and precisely thereby the death of God in Christ. This apocalyptic nullification of God is the blood of, lamb, uh, the blood of the Lamb, or the blood of God, who is absolutely Christ. And thus, it is the resurrection or glorification of existence itself, a glorification which is the resurrection of the body. So you're speaking specifically of what you see the thinking now occurring, saying. Well, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's even affirming the thinking now occurring in a fundamental sense, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that, Lay and I are in many ways very close. There's no question about that. And you, you very astutely point that out, and you're right. You are right. Yeah. Well, Leahy's criticism of your thinking is always that you refuse to begin. You, uh, you celebrate ending, absolutely, but you refuse to begin um, a new world uh, and and commit to a new creation um, in that empty space that uh, the death of God creates, and you call it the dead body of God. Yes. Um, well, that that is a deep difference between us, and in a fundamental sense, uh, yeah. Here, here's where the the, maybe the Protestant Catholic difference may also be significant. I'm not sure, but at any rate, I have the sense of existence as being ashes in a fundamental sense, which he doesn't. And uh, he says, I can't begin. Well, I can't begin an absolutely new life while living in an absolutely dead life. Yeah, okay. So there's in some sense, well, in, in his thinking, there is a, a, a new categorical imperative, he says. Yes. And that imperative is to create the world. Right. And essentially the death of God Theology refuses that, yes. but if there was to be a statement that is a categorical imperative in yes. the death of God theology, what would it be? Well, the imperative is to absolutely accept and will that absolute death which is among us, which is the only way in which we can all be alive. But it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it is a celebration of existence. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Existence is death. Yes, but it has to be celebrated nevertheless. Yes. If that's what we're called to do is to celebrate death. Yeah. Well, or through death, life comes. What? Through death, life comes. You're, you're, yes, the, yes. The, the, the only, fundamental... Not, not just through death, but only through only death. Through death only through death, does life. So the living God only comes through the God who makes that decision to die, let's right, say. Right, right. Um, it's and, only through God's death that grace is real. And I have a quote from the self-embodiment of God, mm -hmm. uh, page 18. A beginning? Yes. A beginning because it is an ending. An actual ending of its real opposite, and thus an actual beginning. Actuality itself is unreal apart from a real beginning. For apart from a beginning, the actual world would be non-actual. Or it would be an actual which is simply identical with its non-actual pole or contrary. So the way I read that, your notion of the primordial God is a completely non-actual God. A God that can no make no difference whatsoever, cannot matter, cannot speak, cannot be embodied, cannot... Well, that's when we're liberated, that we realize that. So that God, who, who is all things, but because all things, in actual, has to negate itself right. in order for an actualization yeah. that uh, begins this whole process of, of kenotic emptying. Right. Um, so that's where God 
God acting against God's self, right. shattering God's self right. as this primordial plenitude gets going this kind of emptying out. It's almost like the shattering of a vessel that's so full it cannot actually be anything at all because it's so stuffed full there's no place for any change or any um, in any story, any narrative, any revelation history. But once you shatter the fullness of the vessel and let it drain, you have this beginning of a revelation history that is actually God's will. It, there you got God's will. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the will to create, the will to incarnation, okay. and the will to die in order to live, right? right? right. So, Right. You state this much more forcefully than I can. Well, you have to read your own books to get the message. May I introduce you Too late. To, to the authentic Christianity that you propose in Genesis and Apocalypse? <laughs> you, your subtitle is A Theological Voyage Toward Authentic Christianity. What is the authentic Christianity versus inauthentic for you? Oh, well, you know what that is. I mean, oh. Yeah, but you're telling other people. Yeah, well... Christianity is commonly known as a dead, inauthentic Christianity. Yes. Because? Well, it just is. <laughs> well, first of all, it's a betrayal of its original ground. I mean, it's an absolute betrayal of the New Testament and the Kingdom of God. And, uh, and that's it. We go into that. And why? What was the motive to deny and repress the uh, apocalyptic ground? What was the motive? If this was so life-giving and so s central to the truth that Jesus preached, why the denial? Well, I think the denial is, is inevitably because original Christianity, among other things, is profoundly threatening. And, and, and people have to escape that, that, that call to the absolute will of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they, you know, so they transform everything. You know, do you have the energy to just talk more on a personal level about when you first met Leahy and first discovered his, his manuscript? And, uh, or, or are you just kind of feeling done like you don't... No, no, no. I, I, I would like to do that. Okay, if I'm, well, trying, trying, I'm just trying... You know, I got a problem here of memory since my memory is so weakened as I've aged. But uh, those early, you, you know, I did write about this in part, partially. After first encountering Leahy. And how did you meet David the first time? When I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to remember. I think that he contacted, oh, I know. Uh, he actually was asking for a job at Stony Brook. And uh, even though there was no such job, I mean, I, I had no job to give him. I didn't advertise a job. It's not as though there was a job there. He was hoping that there was a job there. But at any rate, he came to see me initially about the possibility of teaching at Stony Brook. Because you were the chair of the department at the time? Well, I was chair of religious studies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but at any rate, uh, that, that's, that's what occasioned it. And we had a serious conversation, uh, but, but not a very long one. And as I record, I think in my memoir, isn't it, that he left with me uh, this final part or whatever, the, the appendix uh, to, to Nevitas Monday, the crucial one. And I, I can tell that story again. That night, I once again, as I commonly did in those days, insomnia. And for some reason, the insomnia was particularly pure, particularly uh, actual. And I just was just totally awake. This is about four or five in the morning. And for some reason, maybe to force myself to try to sleep, I picked up this manuscript which David had just left with me. And I started reading it. I thought, my God. This is so overwhelmingly important. It was, I think, one of the appendices in Nevitas Mundi. I said, my God, this is just so absolutely important. So I had an awakening, if you will, 
to the ultimate importance of the thinking now occurring for the first time. And that led me to a commitment to it. So only after that, that I began seriously reading Leahy. And we also began regularly seeing each other. Now, we met regularly and uh, we'd go out to dinner together and that sort of thing. And he, I, I would get upset with him. He'd come over to have dinner with me and stay up to about one or two. And I said, for God's sakes, David, spend the night here. I said, oh no, he would not do that. He'd have to drive home. And I was worried about, it because you know, he'd been drinking enormously. And he had, a, oh, at least an hour's ride home. So that, uh, that concerned me. But, but somehow he never harmed himself in a car. He I don't was know. like Socrates. He could drink and drink and drink and never get drunk. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I, I, he, he drank so sure. much. And then we were going to drive for an hour. I thought, that's terrible, I thought. But at any rate, I couldn't stop him. I said, for God's sake, just sleep here, David. He wouldn't do it. He also had the energy to just talk about things for hours yeah. and hours, all night long. And he, he would never want to end it. He would right. never want to go to bed. He just talked till dawn. I, I've talked till dawn many times. Really? Way, you know. um, now... Um, he had not yet published Novitas Mundi when you, he, you read that. Uh, oh, no, this is manuscript. Uh, oh, yeah, this is just in manuscript. Yeah. Not been published yet. Did you help him? Oh, I played a decisive role in his publishing. Get, get well, I, I introduced him to, to, to Bill Eastman. And no, but uh, and we all went out to lunch together he down first, in the Greenwich Village. What? He first published Novitas Mundi with New York University Press. Oh, so that's right. But so it was republished with... It was the, republished right, with, right. Uh, with SUNY Press. That's right, yeah. But well, wait a second. It was published in 1980 by New York University. That's right. Well, when I first met David, that had not yet been published, I don't think. I don't think so either. No, no, that had not yet been published. But at any rate, uh, I brought him together with Bill Eastman, and that's when he started publishing with the SUNY Press. And I was so pleased with Bill over that. Uh, that that's that's the, the decisive reason why I dedicate this book to Bill Eastman, our greatest publisher. But Bill uh, was a great publisher, and he too very quickly realized the importance of Leahy. And he gave Leahy a uh, kind of attention which is very rare. I mean, he published beautiful editions of this very, very difficult work. And uh, you think of the proofreading that had oh, to go into that, my God. I think it's almost a miracle. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just hard, just hard to believe. Um, so kudos to SUNY Press for that. Yes. For taking on this, um, a particularly foundation with all those diagrams, all that Hebrew, oh, all of yeah. that logic, all of the <laughs> numbers and, and mathematics. Right. Uh, and they took that on and produced a beautiful edition. Um, no, it really is a beautiful flawless. edition, right? Uh, well, I've Bill never, took it with total seriousness. I've never found a typo in the, uh, in foundation, yeah. uh, and you know it's what six hundred pages right. long with all those diagrams. Of course, uh, if there's a typo in the Hebrew or the logic, I I would not find yeah. that. But in, in the Ang English language, um, I don't see any errors. Right, it's just fantastic. Yes. David was very grateful to Bill Eastman, and Bill really did a marvelous amount for him. No question about it. I'm thinking of other figures earlier than Leahy that have been very important uh, dialogue partners for you, and one of them is Iliada. Yes. When, when we bring up Iliada's name, what memories or um, influences come to the fore for you? Well, I was very close to Mirce, of course. And he did so much for me, but uh, one of the things that he was, not only for me, but for a large number of people, he was an incredible bibliographical guide. I don't know if I've told you this story or not, but let me tell you again. Uh, Mircea visited me once at, uh, uh, where was that, Stony Brook or Enmere? I can't remember. I think it was, wait, now I've forgotten which it was. At any rate, one of the two. Must have been Stony Brook. At any rate. 
we had this special roundtable discussion. Oh, right. It, it must have been at Emory because this was ILA, Institute of Liberal Arts. Yeah, it was an ILA seminar. And we had this, oh, we had maybe 20 graduate students or 15 who were already writing their dissertations. And this is an interdisciplinary program that Institute of Liberal Arts at Emory. And, you know, they, they would write their dissertations almost about everything under the sun. But at any rate, these 15 who spoke were representative of this institute. And I asked them to give a brief summary of, of their papers for Mircea's sake. But the way it worked, they would give a brief summary and then Mircea would give them bibliographic advice. And I was just so profoundly impressed because, my God, these dissertations were all over the map, almost on everything under the sun. And each time, Mircea was able to give very serious, solid, even original bibliographic advice. And I was just so stunned by it. He was a great scholar. I mean, it was just unbelievable, just literally unbelievable. And everyone there was so impressed. <laughs> well, after all, his first publication was on bugs. <laughs> he was an entomol entomologist really? to yeah. begin. Didn't yes. <laughs> How much did you get this contrast between the notion of eternal return versus eternal recurrence? Yes. Uh, from Eliade, do you think he helped you define this notion of going back to God? Right, he, he, he certainly enlightened me about eternal return. Mm -hmm. And I think he's probably understood that more deeply than anyone. And he certainly had a deep effect upon me at that point, among others. But, you know, he was a great religious scholar, one of the great religious scholars of his day. And yet he was also a very deep human being. And uh, he was also a novelist, for example. Not that I was, I was only, I, did, I haven't done much reading of his novel. But at any rate, he was a novelist of all things. Bengal Nights, now How that's about? a hot one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many of these were erotic novels. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's really quite something. Yeah. His, his wife was an aristocratic Romanian uh, who uh, I was fond of her, but uh, there's a certain distance between us. One of us was, was because he was an aristocrat. And then uh, another figure very important in that era, Paul Tillich. When we name Paul Tillich, what comes to mind in terms of influences for you? How much did he help you realize your thinking or uh, play an, an active role as a person that you knew? Well, I knew him very well, of course, and we had many dialogues. But uh, initially, he was very important in terms of uh, leading me to recognize that my Christian theological foundations had really broken down and that uh, deeply, were deeply, deeply broken. And he played a decisive role in uh, my realizing this. But uh, that's... How so? I mean, what? In, in what way? How so? Well, he made me realize that I had lost all established theological ground. That I had really um, undergone a kind of, if you go back to that word of yours, perishing, an ultimate theological perishing. Uh, he played a decisive role in helping me to realize how decisive and final this perishing was. Now, of course, he himself had undergone a deep theological perishing, you know, so, so that, that way, you know, he was sharing something with me, but making me realize that this has very deeply happened to me, and he did that more than anyone else. But, um, you know, I, I did respect him very much. After a while, I couldn't take his own theology very seriously, but uh, I, I, he was a marvelous theological critic in many ways. Was it more the later Tillich that you were not so responsive to because you became more conservative theologically? Uh, it's true that I was almost totally disillusioned with the systematic theolo theology, that's right. 
and with all three volumes of it. And I had a sense that the longer he lived, the weaker he became theologically, and that this was a fundamental weakness in him. Uh, and of course, I revere the early Tillich, as most people do. Well, it's a little bit like Bart. Uh, remember that you haven't forgotten that incredible story that, that I think Mircea created. Yeah, I think that we, we shouldn't go into that story because you tell it in detail in your yeah. memoir. They can go there, look for Bart and Tillich in the memoir. Yeah. Uh, it would be a waste of time, in my opinion, to spend time telling that story. Okay. What I'd rather hear is how, now this is a big one, how important Bart was in your finding your theological path. Because uh, his, you remember you had said you would listen to the... Um, the Three Penny Opera, yes. and drink whiskey, and uh, and kind of focus obsessively on Bart, right. and how to kill to kill Bart, your father, in a way. <laughs> well, that's right. I had to kill my father. That's right. That's exactly what I was engaged in. So as I was listening to the Three Penny Opera and drinking whiskey, I was thinking about Bart, and thinking about ending Bart for myself, for my own thinking. And this is very, very difficult. To mack the knife. <laughs> well, that, that, among other things, yeah. But yeah, the three, and three the penny nine, opera. Isn't there a nine in there? Uh, <laughs> in the, the, uh, you, you were conflating the nine in yes. the three penny opera with Bart's nine. To yes, the, right. Yeah, to the... Uh, <clears throat> Well, see, see, Bart is, 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 well, he's really the perfect, overwhelming example. Example's the wrong word. The overwhelming enactor of an absolute ending of theology to make theology possible. In a very profound sense, he ended all theology and thus made possible the recreation of theology. Now, I think he's more important in the ending that he did than the positing that he did, but still, he's overwhelmingly important. I think there's no question about that. What's the problem with Bart? Why do we have to kill him? What, what do you consider the fundamental know. problem? No, I don't know. Oh, I, I can give you my answer. What is your answer? <laughs> that he was a biblical fundamentalist. Oh, I don't think so. No, he was something else. I think he was a Calvinist fundamentalist. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that many people are not aware of is the incredible influence of Bart. And what most deeply impresses me is the way in which he deeply affected so many non-theologians. I mean, he really had a kind of universal impact that, that Bart suddenly made Christianity real to European intellectuals. I mean, that was tremendously important, just tremendously important. Do you and, know he's hardly mentioned these days among people who are interested I didn't know that, in really. radical theology or... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are, of course, Bart scholars that yes. persist in the task of, you know, digesting Bart, but uh, in terms of, like, active live influence, I just don't hear his name mentioned much anymore. Tillich is, that right? is more alive uh -huh. than Bart, you know, uh -huh. it, in, at least in the circles I, I know. How about Lewis? You, you spent time with uh, Lewis, um, the, the German thinker on uh, Heidegger, Nietzsche. Oh, Lewis! Yeah. Well, he was one of my teachers, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a pretty good relation with him. He was such a lonely man, I now regret that I didn't even see more of him. But he's, his writing deeply influenced me. I, I, I've read m most all of his work. And to me, he's just one of the great German scholars, and the, really the best German scholar in the areas in which I'm most interested. And he had this incredible command uh, of Hegel, of Nietzsche, you know, of Kierkegaard, just incredible command of these things. Carl Lehrwitz, yeah. And then also you knew Eric Foglin. Oh, yes, I was close to Foglin, yes. And he's another one. A uh, great thinker. Yes. Uh, synthesizing these diverse figures that right. were very important to you. Right. But it, often with a much more political um, focus, right? Well, I wasn't that interested in his politics, but of course I took him very seriously as a political thinker, nevertheless. 
but you you may not know, be aware of that name, Eric Vogelin, V O E G E L I N. Okay. Now uh, he was probably, I think, the most important conservative thinker of the 20th century. I would think probably. He's much more important than the people who are commonly known as conservative thinkers. He's much deeper, much much greater scholar, of course. But at any rate, uh, he, um, I became very close to him for a variety of reasons. He was, his closest friend was Gregor Seba, who was one of my dear close friends. And Seba and Fogelin were the fundamental ch challenges in modern political theory. So they were sort of, you know, controversial figures. And I sort of hurt myself by becoming associated with them because they both are conservative political thinkers. But it's a radical kind of conservatism. And it's a very theoretical kind of conservatism. At any rate, uh, Fogelin was one of those who certainly affected me, yes. Uh, in your essay on Fogelin and and Strauss, Strauss, yes, uh, you really think that Fogelin trumps Strauss. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say well, that. Well, you say time will tell okay. uh, in weighing the value of each, but okay. you you definitely give priority. You you give favor to Fogelin when you're comparing the two. Oh, well, yes, that's that's my own point yeah. of view. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, he's a very important thinker. There's no question about that to me. Uh, and, and to me, political science is sort of an empty discipline. Uh, I've tried to get into it. It's, I mean, academic political science. It just seems to me like a dull discipline. And he's an exciting thinker. Yeah, He, he has a lot of life, which, which political science as a discipline is simply devoid of, I think. You also met Hannah Arendt. Oh, I was close to Hannah Arendt, yes. You know that name, Hannah Arndt? Sure. Yeah. Oh, Hannah Arndt, my God. I was you, almost in love with her. You sat across the, or beside her at a dinner once. You, you said. Well, th that was my best encounter with her. It was actually a dinner celebrating Paul Tillich. She was close to Paul Tillich. And uh, I was there. It was in Chicago. And uh, I sat next to her. And we had a good, very good uh, conversation including a conversation about Augustine. She's a great August Augustinian scholar. And, uh, yeah, I had a... But I was also very close to her best friend, Joan Stambaugh. And uh, I was much involved with Joan Stambaugh, who was the best friend of Hannah Arndt. So that I, I, I tasted that circle, as it were. This is a New York circle. And another name we can't fail to bring up is Jacob Taubes. Yes. And his wife, uh, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Because Susan. She, Susan. Susan Anima Taubes. Susan Anima Taubes. Yeah. Yes. Now, I, I didn't know Taubes that well. I only actually met him once. Oh, but you were very close to... Um, Edith Wissigard. Yeah. Edith was very much a part of the Taubes. There was a Taubes circle of intellectual Jews in New York City. And Edith was very much a part of that Talbus circle. And so she was uh, close to Talbus. And she actually uh, got us, we had lunch together, Edith and Talbus and myself, in Greenwich Village or something. And um, it, was, it was enjoyable, it, exciting. But the unfortunate thing was that Talbus was then dying. He actually was dying then. And he didn't have much energy, so it couldn't be a very real conversation. Now, there's someone who very powerfully engaged apocalyptic... Yes, uh, absolutely. Apocalyptic history, right. not just thought, but right. history. Right, Um You must have found his work very exciting, I guess. Oh, yes. He deeply influenced me, no question about that. And actually, uh, he was the one who even awakened me to the deep apocalyptic ground of radical thinking and radical understanding. He's the one who awakened me to that in a fundamental sense. But I did not know him well. I really just had that brief encounter with him. Jacob Talbus. Actually, that I was so disappointed in that Talbus circle. Really? And I thought that they were ruining his name. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a Talbus circle, all right.
just want these batteries in my charger. I think we're about to the end here. Okay. Yeah. Well, we should have a drink to celebrate. It's a good end. <laughs> Oh, it's only four o'clock. It's not as late as I thought it was. It's only four? Maybe my watch is wrong. Does anybody have a good watch? Yeah, it's almost four o'clock. What, what ran out there? Okay, Tom. What? Let's not stop uh, filming. Okay. Let's not stop filming just yet, okay? Just for a minute here, yeah. Keep going. She brought in the top hat. Yeah, there you go. Tom, you turn 91 tomorrow. And this is your... We're going to celebrate your birthday now. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Uh, thank you. Very good. Have you gotten me with your camera with this hat on? Yeah, we got you. <laughs> You've got me with the hat. So, Tom, you turn 91 tomorrow. Happy birthday. birthday. Well, it's not yet. That's not yet my birthday. <laughs> By midnight. I mean, happy birthday <laughs> to you. Well, happy birthday to you, Lisa. It's her happy birthday, birthday, too. Birthday to you. You're a singer. Take it, Todd. Happy birthday to you. Oh, yeah. You have a rich voice. Are you a singer, a professional singer? I am yes, a professional singer. Oh, you are a professional. He sang thought... Lohengrin. And the... I, I sang uh, a recital version of, Zieg, of um, Zygmunt of the Valkyrie. You've sung Lohengrin? Lohengrin and uh, uh, recitals both. They were on stage. But... Where did you do this? In New York. No kidding. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, I love the ring. I love Wagner. Yes. I and you also, so do I. You also sang at David Leahy's funeral. I did. I sang. Can you a, do that song a cappella now? I Is sang, that possible? Uh, you know, if I get the words in front of me, I can okay. sing it later because okay. I won't remember. But I sang the Eucharist hymn at his funeral at the very end, which was a great honor for me. He had asked me to do it many You're years before. You're talking about David's funeral now. At David's funeral. He had asked me years before he... Oh, he. this is David himself asked you to do this. Oh, he asked yeah. me to do it. No kidding. And when at I, his funeral. At his funeral. Oh, yes. no kidding. And Annie said Angelicus. Um, Annie Angelicus. Who, supposedly the words were written by Thomas Aquinas. Yes. And not being a Catholic, I was, uh, you know, very surprised. I mean, having grown up a Presbyterian. Um, but anyway, I sang it. And Great. A, uh, wonderful time. And we recorded it, thank goodness. Well, I'm interested that David asked you to do this. So yeah. he was actually preparing his own funeral. My yeah. God. Well, he, seven years before. He this is seven years away. before he died. Yeah. Uh huh. He told me, too, that when he dies at his funeral, he wants Pani Sandilicus to be um, sung. Mm. And um, then when David died, I wrote to Todd and I said, Did you know this? And Todd said, Yes, I'm already. <laughs> the family has asked me. <laughs> I was on vacation in Hawaii with my family and I flew back. Oh, really? Immediately. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That was how much it meant to me, for sure. So I went with, uh, you remember Zarina, my one day, who was quite close with, with Dave, she's an Afghani woman. Yes. Who we visited you once years yes. ago. Yes. She was doing something, she was on a retreat or something in California, and we both flew back and met. Oh, really? And went to the wake, and then had a celebrate, went to the celebration with his family afterwards. And Did they have an actual wake for David? They had a wake. The night Wonderful. before, yeah. and they had a big family party that we were invited to oh, afterwards really? at an Italian restaurant somewhere in Brooklyn. Everyone got completely loaded. It was incredible fun, and it was wonderful meeting these names of people I can't remember, but meeting a lot of his old friends and people that had known Dave when he was living in the village and yeah. when he was a poet. Epic poet. Before he destroyed everything, I suppose. That's right. what I had heard, anyway. Well, that's what he told He told me that he destroyed it. He destroyed the epic poem, but he kept some poems. Did uh, he? Okay. Later, written later. He I sent see. me a poem once. Really? A very short. Yeah. Interesting. I've never seen any of his poetry. Anyway, it was a real Misa Jubilea yeah. to say... Hello to David Lee. Hello, goodbye. Yeah. Because uh, in the ending is the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So. Yes. Well, I remember that great dinner party that, uh, what was that a celebration of? That you it were... was the party now occurring David's 70th birthday. 70th. Yeah, that was it, his 70th birthday, yeah. 
That was a great, great celebration. Okay. Well, I was much impressed with uh, okay. David's family. Uh, yeah. He has some interesting children. Uh, yeah, I got to know uh, his daughter, or one of his daughters, yeah. Amy, a little bit. Yeah. And then his contractor sons. Right. Who um, w wouldn't stop talking about how the fact that uh, they decided to make a lot of money in their lives because... David was so obsessed with his work that money just wasn't that important to him. So <laughs> they ended up doing very well for themselves financially, they said. But they have to thank, you know, their father, of course, for that. <laughs> well, they both were very successful in the construction business, right? Yeah, yeah, they still are. I Made a lot of money. They're still, of course, they're still doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, but I haven't kept in touch um, I lost that too. I with them lost. at all. Yeah. There was a young man named uh, Jared Barkin, who is a poet. Yes. Who uh, David... He keeps sending me his poetry. Yeah, some, some of them I really have enjoyed. Yeah, I read his poetry. Yeah. Uh, and so I stay in touch with... He comes... Sometimes I perform in the city, and so he'll occasionally come. But that's the only one really from Dave's circle that I've kept up with. There was, um, there was a, a lady that... I cannot remember her name. We tried to hook up with each other. Um, with a close family friend. Um, but I just cannot... She was red. She had red hair, I remember. And we went back and forth a few times trying to arrange a, a dinner because I was just interested in maybe knowing a little bit more about Dave's history and hearing more about his... Uh, kind of the roots of his uh, intellectual growth. Uh, but unfortunately, I was never able to, to hook up with her. No, but uh, you know, there's other people that you know, like Chuck Stein and George Quasha and, yes. and those folks. George, uh, Chuck was just in a film that I made. Oh, really? He is a, and it's a film that's loosely based on the ethic of simpli simplicity of Leahy's that I'll I'll send to you. Oh, really? Hey, Tom, I need the car key to go to get Alina at the station. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'll be gone just like ten minutes. Okay. I'll be back with Alina. And then we'll go looking for some snacks and uh, a bottle of bubbly and that kind of thing. Um, Good. Can you guys hang out a little while and have a drink, or are you on your way? Mitch and uh, sure. Kyle? Uh, we can hang out for a bit, but we should head back soon. You want to okay. have a drink? Maybe so you can have just the symbolic toast when I get back? Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. All right. That'd be awesome. Good. Have you ever seen the full ring live? No. No. They're doing it next year in New York. Are they? The Met is. The Met is. The, the whole ring? The whole ring. No kidding. Yep. Well, that hasn't been done for a long time. Well, it? it has been. It was done two years ago. Oh, I didn't... Re oh, that's right. It's a terrible production. Bad re I yeah, hate I it. a rad review. I hate it. the production. It's terrible. There's all these machines moving on stage. I read a very bad review. It gets in the way of the singers. I was yeah. scared watching it because I'm like, wait, one well, of these singers... Well, you were there. I saw... I saw the... I saw, um... Valkyrie and I saw um, Siegfried. Oh. I didn't get to see Gotha Dummerung, which I will. I'm definitely going to see the whole thing next year. Even though I don't like the production, I want to see... Well, is this going to be the same production? That same they, production, That I think. was so panned. I read a terribly yeah. negative review of it. Yeah. And they're going to do that production? Well, I think they are, but I can't be for sure. Uh -huh. Hopefully they're going to do a different one. But I think they, they spent like $120 million dollars. It's throwing away money. It's just, it's insane. Insane, when it would just be better if they went back to like an old Beirut, Bayreuth production yeah. where it was just them wearing little helmets as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But the music, the music's uh, marvelous. Yeah, I was just, I just uh, was making a, um, I just made another short film that's called Not Even a Spot on a Seed which is, comes from the root word for nihil. Oh, really? You know, nay, not, hylum is a spot on the seed. And it's about a little boy who has this realization when he's eight years old that he wants to, that he wants to throw himself into the darkness. So he does, he throws himself into the darkness. And so then he gets kind of crushed by these voices and darkness and these figures that appear in these dreams for him, and then he's trying to work himself out. I actually haven't edited it yet, but he's trying to work himself out 
to this other side of nothing that's a little bit more, has a little bit more light in it, a little bit more liberating. But um, I have to sit down in the editing, editing room and see how it goes. And it'll be very musical as well. Did you ever participate in a production of the ring? Never a production, only recitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. just concert versions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you've done that. Yeah, I've done a, several concert versions of um, singing Zygmunt. Oh, really? And then several concerts of uh, Lohengrin. So you've done a fair amount of Wagner singing yourself. Wagner singing, I auditioned in that world, but you know the call for me was really more around writing and singing and producing and. Mm -hmm. And my own. Uh, so, are you an opera producer? No, I I uh, I produce my own music. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, do you you write up writing music? I write. It's mostly more kind of popular music, but I also do a lot of writing music for t television shows. Oh, do you? So I do oh, a lot of underscore and. Oh, you actually do write for professional television. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. write for professional television, and I have a a project called The Looking, which is my work as an artist oh, really? and I've put out five albums and I've had a small um, label in the city that just has run its life it's now complete but we put out several records of other people and it so kind you of you had a record company as it were a small a small independent really? record label that I ran oh. with a, a couple of people oh. and now I'm in the process of um, something new I want to make films and so I've been starting what kind to do of that films? Well, I just made this film that's loosely based on Leahy's work. Really? And, um, I can't imagine that. Well, it's, um, I'll send it to you, and you can take a close look at it. It's, it's about, um, it's in, we do it in Greek. We do it in Biblical Greek, the whole film. And it's sung. The whole thing is sung by an opera singer. My God. And Chuck Stein is one of the characters in it. He plays a phenomenal role. Oh, he actually acts in it? He acts in it. Oh, really? He's a great performer. Is he? Really great. I've never seen him. I either. can't wait to get him into something else. Oh, like really? he's so good. Is he really? Well, he's he's great on camera. He's a little bit. You got to rein him in because he's not he's he's not as rehearsed as I would like him to be coming into the set. At least this last thing we did, but we got we got the takes that we needed, and um, so as I'm developing things, I'm always thinking about ways of bringing him in, like specifically writing for. Him. Oh, really? Because he's such a great sound poet and a, it's spontaneous. It goes into this thing about. Initially, I wanted to do a film called Glossolalia. And as I was researching it and kind of just. I had this divine flash of sorts about this, this film ended up being called Wrapped Tongue, R A P T. That's the name of the film that I made. Oh, really? And. Um, as I researched, as I was trying to find sources to read about the history of Glossolalia, all I was finding was Pentecostal stuff. And I didn't like the fact that it was just, I, I just didn't like, it, it, there wasn't a lot of meat to it, you know? It's very shallow. Very shallow. And I thought, you know, forget the Glossolalia thing. And then I had this, the, this passage from the book of Revelation kept coming, the Alpha and Omega passage. So I was like, wait, the whole thing's going to be around that passage. And about how this woman, or how this man, is super confused. And he keeps saying the passage backwards. And Chuck's a great visual artist as well. I don't know if you've seen any of his work. He just had a major book published by, uh, I forget who it was published by, but there were these fantastic ink drawings. By him? That he spends, spends hours on. Oh, really? No, I didn't know about that. When I had the flash of this character, I kept seeing this artwork, but I didn't know what it was. And so I sat down, I talked to Chuck, and I'm like, Chuck, I want you to be in this, and here's what you're going to do, but I need this artwork. And he said, oh, I have been doing this artwork recently. I'm like, hallelujah. So it ended up that we used his artwork as these maps oh, really? that he's sending out to this creature well she's she's the opera singer she's this beautiful woman that sings contemporary operatic music in the city and around the world now she has a great name ariadne grief what's her ethnic origin you know i'm not for sure I, she's jewish for sure mm -hmm. um but I'm, I'm not sure 
her father is uh, a bit of a singer in the city as well. <coughs> but when I saw this thing, I didn't know her, but I'd heard about her, and I'm like, she's the one we got to get in this film. Went back and forth for her for a long time and got her in. But anyway, she hears this call of this guy who kept singing this thing backwards. And she hears it in the woods, and she starts to turn the phrase around for him. So it's this journey of her coming to meet him in this old, decrepit house in Connecticut, in Lyme, Connecticut, which we found to shoot the film in. It's an incredible location. And it's basically him having this epiphany of how the sentence goes, she turning it around, and then just singing it full blown into the camera at the very end. We did the whole thing live. Um, so, you know, it was, I was saying that I was really thankful to get really on this Bergman kick because as I was watching this thing last night, I wasn't actually seeing what films need to be made yet, but I was like, this is going to be an entryway for me. I can tell. It's like an initiation of sorts in terms of what needs to be made. Because where I'm coming from as a filmmaker isn't about wanting to tell like a particular story, it's more about, it's something that's more epic, it's something that's more, and it's something that probably doesn't have a huge audience, but it has an audience that, you know, wants to see this stuff for sure, but it's very, uh, potentially has um, a lot of, you know, significance in terms of um, the, the materials that I'm hoping that I can bring together. I've been working on a script right now that I want to shoot up in northern Wisconsin, but I'm not satisfied with it. It's more of like a hero's journey thing. Mm. So um, I'm finishing a couple projects right now. I started a new album of my own material yeah. just this past week. So I'm working on that. I want to get this all edited and ready to go. And um, another script that's based on some family history in Indiana where I grew up. Where did you grow up in Indiana? I grew up in this town called Carmel, Indiana. It was part it's of Indiana, is it? Just north of Indianapolis. It's oh, a suburb. Right. These guys are both from Indiana as well. Oh, really? Yeah. I spent a couple of years there teaching at Wabash. Oh, right. Oh, that was right. really early on, right? Yes. That was like very... Yeah, I remember reading that. Yeah. Yeah, we all went to Indiana University. I see. Where I studied philosophy and played music. And they, then I they went... They have a great music department in Indiana, don't it's they? It's great. People tried to get me into the opera program at that point, but I was very much into punk rock at the time. Oh, really? And I was singing in punk rock bands. And oh, we're singing in punk rock bands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, then I went to the University of Chicago Divinity School. Oh, I had, oh really? That's I, right, we talked about I was that. set up to, to do a dissertation with David Tracy, but then I didn't want to do it. It was a um, little too conservative for me, the whole thing. So I finished my master's, and then I left moved to New York and focused on music full time. But I loved it. I loved the University of Chicago. Oh, it was did you so have? much. It was my the best academic experience I, I ever had in my life. And You're talking about the Divinity School now. The Divinity School. But I was alien there. I didn't fit in at all. It was I didn't fit into the ministry program which I thought at first I was going to do. I was really an oddball there. And then when I got into the the you know just doing a masters of arts there I still didn't really fit in. Uh, David liked me because my French was really good. And he wanted me to start helping him translate some of David's phenomenological texts. But I was just not interested in Tell it Tell me, all. is David still alive? I think he is. Have you heard anything about him recently? I haven't. I haven't. I, did, I, did I haven't not... seen him for so many years. The last time I saw him was at one of these big theological meetings. And I had a brief but good chat with him. But he seemed to be in good, that was about five years ago, I guess. He seemed to be in good shape then. Yeah, I think, um, as far as I know, he's still alive. And the other you know, person... He's never, another one that somehow gets stuck or something because his creativity came to an end. Yeah, there wasn't much, there wasn't much, he had very little to say and then it was done, I yes. think. yes. And then I got very interested in post-modernity, so there was this guy named Arnold Davidson that was at the University of Chicago at the time. He had studied uh, with Michel Foucault for a number of really? years, uh -huh. and I was very into Foucault at the time. Mm -hmm. So took some classes with him, and then there was a woman who was at, in the comparative literature department who had become fascinated. Her name was um, 
I mean, I probably wouldn't know. She was the head of the department, I remember, but she was, I, we, we studied Mallarmé and Baudelaire, and uh, she was trying to bring together the atheological tendencies.